So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, because uh, of many reasons, including the fact that there is a big chance that nations, nation states will fall and we will be in a place where we have to defend ourselves. And also because when we're looking at issues of our history uh, and just knowing the rules of engagement in Islam is generally a good thing. So we will be going over the fiqh of the jihad as it is in our books of fiqh. And for this I will be using two sources uh, for now. Uh, this will be a very dry discussion. This is not, you know, this is this is an uh, this is a dry discussion for those people that want to know. And, uh, and every people in every city should know these rules. And also, there is a lot of academic. Uh, there's a lot of points that are Im important, interesting that come out of these uh, discussions. So these are long discussions. They're relatively boring. Uh, but they are important. So if somebody takes the time to, and you know, I'll try to make it less boring. But uh, reading, uh, I will be using English, uh, but I'll be using classical texts. Uh, for Umdatu Salik, the English and Arabic are side by side. Uh, for Umdatu Salik, the other thing I would say is that I, I start off with Imam Shafi's fiqh and then go to Ibn Rushd from Badayatul Mujtahid. Uh, I use Umdat Salik from Imam Shafi because Shafi's have, in my opinion, uh, my feeling, my opinion after, you know, when you generally they have the strictest opinion when it comes to Kitab al Jihad when, or this Faslul al Jihad. In, in the topic of Jihad, they have the toughest opinions amongst the Fuqaha. And uh, so that's why I'm going to start off with uh, reading off from Umdat Salik. And then after that, we will go to Bada'at al-Mujtahid, and that will be, and that will have other details there that are not in Umdat al-Salik. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, uh, jihad means war. Huwa qital. Qital al-Kuffar. Now, over here I want to mention, when, uh, you know, the thing that the West has made famous is the word uh, jihad. But war in Quran is qital. Okay, and fight in the path of those who fight against you. So actually, war is qital. Okay, or qital is also means to fight. Okay, so fight and war uh, have similar similar word. Jihad means war against non-Muslims. فَهُوَ قِتَالُ الْكُفَّارِ وَجِهَادٌ مَعْهُودٌ مِنَ الْمُجَاهِدَةِ And uh, the word jihad is uh, etymologically derived from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish the deen. This is a very important point that uh, j the purpose of jihad is to establish the deen, okay, establish the sharia. And that means the five maqasid, okay, the protection of life for all, the protection of the deen for all, the protection of everyone's wealth, just like the Prophet said in Hujat al Wuda, that your lives and your wealth. And your honor is protected on this day, on this month, you know, as this month is, just as sacred as this month is, and this place is, yani. So anyway, uh, so to protect the aql of the people, this is why alcohol is not allowed, gambling is not allowed, because it plays with the aql of the people, and to play, uh, and to protect the sulb, the, the, uh, the ancestry, and the, the progeny, and the genes of people, okay? It has to be clear to a child who's your father, and so on and so forth, and, and this also goes into in issues of genetic manipulation, which Shaitan wants to do. Okay, it is uh, signifying warfare to establish the deen. So the purpose is to establish Islam, to establish the peace, establish the model of justice for all people to see. Okay, and that's why you'll notice this is under the chap jihad is under the chapter of jihad uh, justice in uh, Umdat al Salik. Uh, it is. Uh, and it is a less it is a lesser jihad, meaning jihad is, that is qital to establish a deen is the lesser jihad. As for the greater jihad, it is spiritual warfare against the self, which is why the Prophet ﷺ has said that we have returned from a lesser jihad to a greater jihad. Uh, even though this hadith is weak, but in some ways it is uh, it is true in its meaning, meaning uh, 
that uh, you have to have good individuals that will, you know, if you're establishing the deen, you have to have good individuals. So good individuals need to fight that are honest, that are just, that are not going to take revenge because others made them victims. They're able to forgive and they're, ha they're able to be like the Sahaba. So they have to fight themselves before they can even deal with the Jamal where, you know, there's stress and and then sometimes you don't like what the emir said, and sometimes, you know, things happen where you have to fight against yourself, okay, and you have to forgive and let go for the bigger cause, okay. The scriptural basis for jihad prior to the scholarly consensus is the Quranic verse, Kutiba alaykum al qital. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kutiba alaykum al qital, which means fighting Kutiba means it's written, it's ordained, it is prescribed, it is fought. Kutiba alaykum al qital. Okay. Uh, qital has been ordained for you. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, slay them wherever you find them. And this is where, you know, uh, you will find uh, this verse, uh, slay them wherever you find them. Uh, is about once the battle is already uh, begun, okay? And so, uh, and then uh, Allah says, قَاتِلُوا mushrikeen And uh, fight the mushrikeen, okay? So again, uh, this is in case where the battle has begun and then you have to fight them. And the hadith on the one related to Bukhari and Muslim in which the Prophet wasallam said, I have been commanded to fight people until they testify there is no God but Allah and His Messenger. Perform the prayers, pay the zakat. If they say it, they have saved their blood and possessions from me except for the rights of Islam over them and their final reckoning is with Allah. Now over here is something important that should be known. That there are two aspects of jihad. One is in the time of the Prophet. You know, there are certain things uh, that are specific to the Prophet uh, like, for example, he can marry more than four wives. Uh, like, for example, he can fast consecutively. There are some things that are specific to the Prophet. One of them, so the ayat in the beginning from, uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Ba'idah, this Sharia, and the ayat of Jihad in the beginning are umum, they're for the whole Muslim. But uh, the ayat of Jihad that are between that are in Surah Tawbah, basically the first ten verses, they are specific to the Prophet, and that is that has to be understood that there is a Sunnah of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "La aghlibanna ana wa rusuli. I and my Prophet have to prevail. A messenger of Allah cannot be killed, and when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala sends a messenger to a nation and he's communicated the message and he's shown them the miracle they see the camel coming out of the mountains and the, he's he's given them the message and if they don't accept the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then one of the three things can happen either a they accept the message and they're okay or two Allah will punish them you bi aydikum Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them with your hands okay meaning the hands of the Sahaba, because he, they are representing, they are, they are fighting on behalf of the Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger is fighting on behalf of Allah. Then I've conveyed the message and you're not accepting it. They have to either accept or they have to be eradicated from the world. So this was what was being said in Mecca that, oh, you know, okay, bring on that. Because when Allah's Prophet has delivered a message, Okay, just like the previous prophets, then once the message is delivered, then judgment has to come. Either they will accept or they will the punishment will come upon them. A good example of this is Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam, right? Yun, Prophet Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam, he went to his people, he did da'wah to them, and the punishment was coming. And he said the punishment is coming. But he left his people before the punishment came. He didn't witness the punishment, right? So the punishment was coming, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed, it, it stopped the punishment, because they saw the punishment coming, they saw the clouds, they did tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the messenger had left his place of duty, meaning Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam. This is why he went into the 
fish. Okay, so when uh, so then he came back and all that, and Allah forgave uh, him. It was not a mistake. I mean, prophets are masum, but he made a misjudgment. You know, he thought, well, the punishment's coming. I should go. As you remember from the seerah of the Prophet sallam, a messenger is not allowed to leave his position of duty until Allah subhanahu wa taala allows him to give the permission to do hijrah. Okay, so. Uh, the prophets of Allah, they have a special place when it comes to jihad. And so when the Prophet ﷺ says, أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِلَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَقُولُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ I have been commanded to fight the people until they say لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ That is specific to the Prophet. Otherwise, the rule is لَا إِكْرَحْ فِي الدِّينِ There's no compulsion in deen. There's no forcing in deen. And one of the maqasid uh, al-sharia, one of the objectives of sharia is to help people protect their own deen. Right? And this is why the Qur'an... Uh, actually engages the Ahlul Kitab. Quran is the book that engages. You know, قُلْ يَا أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ You know, say, and, and uh, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ For you is my deen and for you is your deen. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to accept the truth out of our free will or reject the truth out of our free will. The main thing is the Muslims have to convey the message and Muslims have to establish the Sharia where they are in where, where it is possible for them to do so, okay? Whether they, it is majority or not is a secondary issue. So, uh, but uh, Imam Shafi'i, uh, especially, and uh, the, from the fiqhi perspective, even though this is the, uh, the asuli perspective that I gave you right now, that the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was sent to a people in Nijatu Ilaikum Khasatan. I've sent to you been to you specifically and to all of mankind in general. So the Prophet himself established the deen in in front of his people in his lifetime. He established the model for the people to see in his own lifetime. Okay? Because he was sent there and he was the last messenger. And he had to establish the deen. And he had to show that example. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ sent that example, and that example had certain elements to it that were specific to him. And so this is the Asuli perspective that's very important to know. Okay, The Fiqhi perspective uh, is uh, the one that we're going to read. But these distinctions are also important, especially in today's times. The Asuli, the Asuli principles are important for our times in order to understand that just like, I'll give you an example. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يمسو إلا المطحرون No one can touch, uh, no one touches the Qur'an, meaning the angels. It's very clear the, an the ayahs about angels. No one touches the Qur'an except for the, for the most purified. Clear? Meaning the angels cannot, only the most purified touch the Qur'an, meaning the angels. But from here the fuqaha, the, they extrapolated, uh, لا يمسو إلا المطحرون Okay, no one can, no one touches it except for those that are purified themselves, meaning without doing wudu. Uh, you cannot touch it unless you have wudu, meaning that's what is extra. Even though the ayah is clearly about angels because it's talking about the Quran that is in uh, Ummul Kitab, Fi Kitab Maknun, La Yumasul Al Mutaharun, the hidden book that no one touches except for the purified, meaning the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so now. Uh, the, no one touches the book except for the most purified. But from here we extrapolate. Why? Because of the lam. You know, that la is not only for the angels, but the la can be uh, for for everyone. And the illa is for, could be for everyone, right? Meaning even though the ayah is talking about angels, but I say, for example, uh, no one can uh, go up there except for the people have, who have green shirts. Okay, and so meaning the people that are upstairs, they all have green shirts, meaning the only them, or it could also be the people that have green shirts down here. Okay, so it has a it has a it has a it has a spiritual uh, meaning. No one can touch it except for the purified, meaning except for those that are purified themselves, they can touch the Quran, meaning get to the meaning of Quran, or no one can touch it except for the purified, meaning the angels in its meaning of the context of the ayah, but. Also, no one can touch it except for the purified, meaning that uh, the uh, that that is a general principle of touching the Quran because of the negation la and then the illa. Okay, so meaning the question is: is there a, is there a hukum in here? And the answer that some of the fuqaha would give is yes. So 
uh, the point of this uh, being that uh, there's sometimes asuli principles and sometimes there are fiqhi principles and sometimes they uh, they they most of the time they're symbiotic but they need to be understood uh, in their proper context okay um, then uh, there's a report go forth in the morning or evening to fight in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is better than the whole world and everything in it. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu said. So jihad is a very big thing. Just like you know, every civilization has their uh, has their heroes, right? You have the uh, the Americans who love the GI Joes. They love the cowboys. They love the Batman, the Superman who are fighting for good. And then you know you have the Japanese samurai. You have the knights. You, some people you know would idealize the Vikings or some of these other. You know, the idea is you have heroes who are fighting for the just cause. And so this is the same thing in Islam, okay? Details concerning jihad are found in the accounts of military expeditions of the Prophet Wasallam, including his own uh, uh, martial forelays and those on which he dispatched others. Uh, the former consists of the ones he personally attended some 27, others say 29 of them. He fought in eight of them, killed only one person with his noble hand, Ubay ibn Khalf, at the Battle of Uhud. On the later, exp later expeditions, he sent others to fight, himself remaining at Medina, and these were 47 in number. Okay, uh, The obligatory character of jihad. Jihad is a communal obligation, yani, uh, fardul kafaya. But uh, there needs to be a discussion. Again, we're coming to the principle of the issue is that Fardul Kafaya is more important than Fardul Ayn. Uh, remember this principle, and Iqbal talks about this principle too. That is that if we make a collective decision, if we were supposed to fight, for example, we were supposed to stand up and seek self determination, or supposed to stand up and establish the Sharia, and we didn't, then all of us will be punished. So, even though Fardul al Kafaya is seen as a lesser obligation, like, um, you know, Fardul al Kafaya, for example, in Ramadan, you have to do itikaf. If you don't do itikaf, it's a sin on everyone. But the Fardul al Kafaya are those types of sins that which you get punished for in this world and the next world. Okay? And Allah knows best. Jihad is a communal obligation, it's Fardul Kafaya. Uh, when a, enough people perform it to successfully accomplish it, it is no longer obligatory on others. Meaning, when the objective of that, por, por, uh, for example, crisis, where you have to defend yourself and everyone is, has to, uh, there has to be enough people defending themselves to be defended. And that obligation is not lifted until the task is done. In the same way, the obligation to establish the Sharia is not done till the Sharia is actually established. Okay, so it is an obligation upon uh, everyone uh, until the task is done. And if people see the task is not being done, and they have the knowledge it's not being done, then it becomes fard upon them to to all. Then it becomes personal. It becomes fardul ayn on them to fulfill the fardul kafaya. Okay, so uh, when even when even people perform it successfully accomplish it, it is no longer obligatory upon others uh, the evidence for which is the prophet saying sallallahu alaihi wasallam he provides the equipment for a soldier in jihad has himself performed it okay uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most high says um, for those of the believers who are unhurt but sit behind right are not equal to those who fight in the Allah's path with their properties and their lives. Allah has preferred those who fight with their property and lives a whole degree above those who sit behind, and to each Allah has promised a great reward. Okay, if none of those concerned, now uh, we can have a discussion on this important issue. Like in the state of Israel, every citizen is part of the army. Every citizen has to take army training. I think after high school they do it. So if there is an Islamic civilization, an Islamic society, uh, will basically it seems like every person can be drafted. Every person can be told you have to go fight, depending upon the need, right? But everyone should be trained, okay? 
so there in in the islamic state every person will be trained for uh fatuwa for islamic chivalry okay you can say like that uh if none of those concerned perform jihad and it does not happen at all then everyone who is aware that it is obligatory is guilty of sin and there if there was a possibility of having performed it in the time of the prophet sallallahu jihad was a communal obligation after his uh, immigration to his migration or immigration to medina as for subsequent times there are two possible states in respect to non-muslims first is when they are in their own countries in which case jihad is a communal obligation and this is what our author is speaking of when he says jihad is a communal obligation meaning upon muslims uh, each year now what used to happen each year is that they would recruit the army in the time of hajj okay the second state is where non-muslims invade a muslim country or near one to it in which case jihad is personally obligatory upon the inhabitants of that country who must repel the non-muslims with whatever they can okay so uh there so basically there is the jihad is a communal obligation meaning upon muslims each year so there is the the jihad of protecting your frontiers so that's one and the other is if some someone it seems like they're about coming close to invade you or they are invading you then that's the second uh situation that can occur okay jihad is a personally obligate is personally obligation upon all those present in battle lines okay and to flee is a big sin provided one is able to fight if unable because of illness or death of one's mount uh, or the death of one's mount one is not able to fight on foot and because one is no longer ha one no longer has a weapon then one may leave one may also leave if the opposing non-muslim army has more than twice the size of the muslims this twice the size uh, imam ibn rushd also discusses this that uh, at what point is retreat uh, not allowed to happen meaning at what point are you not allowed to retreat and so he also feels that once you are twice the size of the army you're fighting then retreat is it would be a sin okay to to do a retreat at that point and uh, he talks about it in terms of not just numbers but also in terms of strength which we'll come to later on jihad is also obligatory for everyone personally obligatory for everyone who is able to perform it male or female young or old when the enemy has surrounded the muslims on every side have, have, having entered our territory even if the land consists of ruins okay even if the land consists of ruins jihad is also obligatory for everyone able to perform it male or female young or old when the enemy has surrounded the muslims on every side having entered our territory even if the land consists of ruins wilderness or mountains for non-muslim forces enter entering muslim lands is a weighty matter that cannot be ignored but must be met with effort and struggle to repel them by every possible means all of which is conditions if conditions permit gathering the above mentioned people uh, provisioning them and readying them for war if conditions do not permit this then when the enemy has overrun the muslims such as that they are unable uh, unable to provision or prepare themselves for war then whoever is found by a non-muslim and knows he will be killed if captured is ob obliged to defend himself in whatever way possible so this is when they're about to enter into your homes and take you as hostages but if not certain then he may be he he but if not certain that he will be killed meaning that he might be might or might not be as when he might merely be taken as a captive so if he's taken as a captive he knows he will be and he knows he will be killed if he does not surrender then he may either surrender or fight okay so depending upon the situation now notice as you're reading a woman too has a choice between fighting or surrendering if she is certain that she will not be subjected to an 
indecent act if captured. Uh, if uncertain, she will be safe from such an act. She is obliged to fight and surrender is not permissible. So for women, it is not permissible. They have to fight. Okay, the point now I want to share with you here is that it's very, very important understanding this, that there is this, what we're reading right now, this, what we just read right now, is a good example of, see, this is fiqh, right? But this is uh, fiqh from a perspective of humans trying to look at the sharia and come up with some wisdom of how to operate. Okay? And so, uh, this is not from the Quran, it is not uh, directly from the sunnah, but this is talking about uh, the fiqhi situation. Okay? The fiqhi situation means if you are brought to court, right? And then on what basis do you say I did surrender or on what basis do you say I didn't surrender? Uh, you were you are going because if every citizen in the Muslim country is is part of the military Are you going to be honorably discharged or you're not going to be honorably honorably discharged? This is really what is being in some sense is being discussed here. Okay, so Also remember the fiqhi aspects meaning the qanuni aspects uh, They are there's a the part that where Allah gives a hukam for example you have to do this, it's going to either be fard, it's going to be sunnah, it's going to be wajib, it's going to be mustahab, it's going to be jaiz, it's going to be mubah, it's going to fall into one of the fiqhi categories. Then there are recommendations that are flexible. It could be this, it could be this, you could do this, you could do this, you can do this. These are usually uh, not something that has a direct hukam uh, and not part of the ma'khuz of the deen. Yani they are secondary, they are extrapolations of extrapolations, meaning you look, you're looking at the Quran and the Sunnah and then you're looking at uh, how to derive rulings um, based upon that. And that is a human effort. Okay, And so you'll see that a lot in these fiqhi rulings, that there's a lot of human effort to give direction. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that there is the maqasad of sharia, which is the purpose of sharia, to establish Islam, establish the justice, right? And then there's the practical situation in a wartime situation or in a situation where you're dealing with enemies. There's a practical situation and then there's the ideal situation, which has to do with the maqasad of sharia. So the maqasad of sharia and sometimes the practical situation can contradict. And this is why a lot of times the fuqaha have many different opinions between the two. But today, Muslims are in a situation where they need to look at the ideal. They need to look at things from the perspective of the maqasid of the sharia rather than from practicality because practicality is always lower than ideal, right? And so we want to start with our ideal so then when we're faced with a practical situation, we can now say, look at some, some of the rules and say, this is how they did it before but this is our ideal, this is how we're going to do it now, okay? And Allahu A'lam. So, uh, let me just uh, read this part again so this is clear because uh, even I made a slight mistake, I think, in explaining something. So, this is an important. Jihad is also obligatory for every uh, one. When the enemy has surrounded the Muslims on every side, having entered our territory, even if the land consists of ruins, wilderness, or mountains, for non-Muslims, entering Muslim lands is a weighty matter and cannot be ignored, must be met with effort and struggle to repel them by every possible means. Meaning, this is Quranic, right? Right? Uh, uh, all of which is, con uh, all of which is, if conditions permit gathering people, uh, provisioning them, readying them for war. If conditions do not permit this, meaning if you cannot get ready. Okay, and they have now entered as when the enemy has overrun the Muslims such that they're unable to, to uh, you know how you see in movies sometimes that the army comes in and everyone was just doing their shopping or they were in the marketplace and people were at home and so then the army just comes in and you were never prepared okay so if conditions do not permit this as when the enemy has overrun the Muslims such that they are unable to provision or prepare themselves for war then whoever is found by a non-Muslim and knows he will be killed 
if captured, is obliged to defend himself in whatever way possible. But if not certain, so now this thing that, am I certain that they're going to kill me? Or am I not certain that they'll kill me? How do you make this distinction, right? There's nothing in, uh, there's nothing like this in the Sharia. But this is man-made guidance. And so, but what will the judge, if you come before the judge, what is he going to ask? You surrendered? Okay, why'd you surrender? Uh, I was pretty sure they're not going to kill me and I didn't have power. Okay, you're honorably discharged. Uh, you know, so these, these are, this is kind of like, so if conditions do not permit this, when the enemy has overrun the Muslims such that they're unable to, uh, unable to provision or prepare, them, prepare themselves for war, then whoever is found by a non-Muslim and knows he will be killed if captured is obliged to defend themselves in whatever way possible. But, and, 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 but if not certain, then will be killed. If, if not certain that he will be killed, meaning that he might or might not be as when he might merely be taken captive and he knows he will be killed if he does not surrender, then he may surrender or fight. Okay, a woman too has a choice between fighting or surrendering. If she is certain she will not be subjected to indecent act if captured. If uncertain, then she will be safe from such an act. If uncertain, then if uncertain that she will be safe from such an act, she's obligated to fight, and surrender is not permissible. Okay, so women have to fight to death. Um, Who is obliged to fight in jihad? Those called upon to perform jihad when it is a communal obligation are every able-bodied man who has reached puberty and is sane. So this is going to be part of the foreign policy of the Muslim state. And this will be uh, something that is recruiting for the army which happens. The following may not fight in jihad someone in debt now there's a difference of opinion about this which we'll talk about in when we talk about when we t read uh, ibn uh, ibn rushd's uh, book of badayat al mujtahid unless he's a creditor and gives him leave or someone with at least one muslim parent until they give their permission unless muslims are surrounded by the enemy in which case it is permissible for them to fight without permission it is offensive to conduct uh, conduct a military expedition against hostile non-Muslims without the Caliph's permission. Okay, Muslims may not seek help from non-Muslim allies unless Muslims are considerably outnumbered and the allies are of goodwill towards Muslims. Objectives of Jihad The Caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, provided he has first invited them to enter Islam in faith, practice, and if not, uh, if, and if they will not, then invite them to enter the social order of Islam by paying the non-Muslim poll tax jizya, which is the significance of their, uh, which is the significance of their paying it, not the money itself, while remaining in their ancestral religions, until they become Muslim or else pay non-Muslim poll tax. Okay, so fight them who do not believe in Allah in the last day and who forbid not what Allah and his messenger have forbidden, who do not practice the religion of truth, being of those who have been given the book until they pay the, the jizya, and out of their hands and they're humbled. What the scholars talk about in this particular ayah is it seems like the objective of fighting itself in this ayah is no, is that they give jizya. So Allah says, fight those who do not believe in the last day and do not forbid what Allah and His Messenger have forbidden and do not practice the true religion being uh, being of those, you know, uh, that are given the book until, fight them until they give jizya. So the purpose of fighting is that they give jizya according. But, again, has to be very, very clear. This particular verse, again, has to do with Surah al -Tawbah. And if you remember my earlier discussion, the surahs in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah are general, and Surah al -Tawbah is specific to the time of the Prophet Wasallam that you have to give jizya and you have to become small. So all those rulings that we will, uh, you know, that have to do with, um, uh, that have to do with 
you know, you have to dress differently, you have to, um, you know, uh, not uh, ring the bell of your church, you cannot put a cross on your church, you cannot have a publicly uh, prom promoted uh, event, you know, so on and so forth. All these rulings are specifically for the place the Prophet ﷺ established his deen, okay? And this is what's agreed upon, okay? So this is for all, all that area for which the Prophet ﷺ established his deen, and then some of these rules were later on applied to the garrison cities, okay? This is how it happened. And then it became confusing after that to many of the people, and especially the conquerors, where they were not able to make this distinction, okay? The time and place for which before the final descent of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and after his final coming, nothing but Islam will be accepted from them. Okay, For taking the poll tax is only effective until Jesus. Right? When Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes, he will abolish the jizya. Because all the Christians will become Muslims. And this is one of the re the things that Shaitan is doing right now, causing discord between Muslims and Christians right now, for especially Orthodox Christians, because Shaitan knows, and uh, the Jal's plan is to divide this uh, possible alliance, because we know when Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes back, all Christians will become Muslims. And, uh, and according, I mean, the Quran actually uses the word Ahlul Kitab, so that will include many of the Jews also. Nothing but, but, but Islam will be accepted from them for taking the poll taxes only effective until Isa a.s. descent, which is divinely revealed a law of Prophet Muhammad The coming of Jesus did not, did not entrail a separate divinely revealed law, uh, for he will rule by the law of Prophet Muhammad As for Prophet saying, I am the last and there will be no prophet after me. This is what he said. This does not contradict the coming, the final coming of Jesus. Uh, upon him be peace, since he will not rule according to the uh, to the gospel. Okay, but will be a follower of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The caliph fights all other peoples until they become Muslim, because they are not a people of the book, nor honored as such, and are not permitted to settle. With uh, to settle without paying the jizya. Uh, now, this is specifically again for the Arab lands. Okay, the land in which the Prophet ﷺ came specifically to fulfill the promise of Ibrahim wasalam, Okay, which Mulla Farahi has called uh, Itmami Hujjat, and which Dr. Umar calls basically the promised land of Abraham. Okay, um, so now. And, and, you know, I, I find this uh, uh, good that, you know, two different scholars from two very different backgrounds have come basically to the same conclusion from an Asuli perspective. And we will be talking about uh, some of the Asuli perspectives in terms of, you know, what the deen wants and, and, and certain Asuli principles, and then uh, what is the practical situation in terms of the law. Okay, so now... Um, the caliph fights all people until they become Muslim, okay? Meaning that the foreign policy in the olden days, they didn't have media, they didn't have a way to get the message of Islam to anyone else. The only way you could get the message of Islam to anyone else is if your army went there and they presented the model, okay? So that was nowadays, things are uh, better in a sense that you don't need an army, right? So for example, the United States of America sent an army to Iraq. Why? To establish democracy. Get rid of Saddam, establish democracy, to show the people of Iraq this is what democracy looks like. So it's, it's very, it was very much like that, except they didn't have the media sources to convince the people. Okay, so um, this must be kept in mind as far as the maqasid of Sharia are concerned. Okay, um, then, because they are not a people of the book, nor honored as such, and are not permitted to settle with paying the poll tax. Okay, uh, this is referring to the mushrikeen of Arabs specifically. Though, according to the Hanafi school, peoples from all religions, even idol worshipping, are permitted to live under the protection of the Islamic State if they either become Muslim or agree to pay the poll tax. So, again, this is the difference between Imam Shafi and Imam Abu Hanifa, because Imam Abu Hanifa is a lot more lenient when it came to treating non Muslims, which is one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the time of Qadi Abu Yusuf in the Abbasid period and then later on the, in the Ottomans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the, the, the Hanafi fiqh to spread because the, the other fuqaha are a lot more um, strict and because the Ottomans were people who had converted to Islam, so they also, you know, and Imam Abu Hanifa lived in Kufa uh, where there was a, it was a very diverse type community. Um, so though according to the Hanafi school, peoples all of other religions, even idol worshipping, are permitted to live under the protection of the Islamic State if they either become Muslim or agree to pay the poll tax. The sole exception to which are apostates from Islam, idol, idol worshippers who are Arabs. So this being Arabs, idol worshippers who are Arabs, has to do with what? Has to do with the, the specific risala of the Prophet Wasallam to the Arabs, okay? Either of whom has any uh, choice but becoming Muslim. So if you're an Arab who is an idol worshiper, you have no choice but to become Muslim, okay? Or you're killed, okay? That was the law of the divine law, okay? Now, uh, let us move on to rules of warfare. It is not permissible in uh, jihad to kill women or children unless they are fighting against the Muslims. Or, nor is it permissible to kill animals unless they are being ridden on to battle against the Muslims. It, if, or it killing them will help defeat the enemy. It is permissible to kill old men, okay, uh, meaning a sheikh, an old sheikh, even though the word sheikh has two meanings, but this is the old man meaning, meaning someone more than 40 years of age and monks. Okay, it is permissible to kill old men as well as monks. And you'll see when we read Imam, uh, Imam uh, Ibn Rushd's uh, Bada'at al-Mujtahid that uh, you, it mentions other opinions that you're not allowed to kill the monks. And the Prophet Sallallahu specifically said that in a riwayah. It is unlawful to kill a non-Muslim to whom a Muslim has given a guarantee of protection. Whether the non-Muslim is one or more than one, provided the number is limited and that the Muslims protecting them does not harm the Muslims as when they are spies. Provided the protecting Muslim has reached puberty, is sane, does, does so voluntarily and uh, is not a prisoner of them or, or a spy. Meaning he's doing it voluntarily. He says, okay, I'll give these people uh, protection. Whoever enters Islam before capture may not be killed or his property confiscated or his young children taken captive. When a child or a woman is taken captive, they become slaves by the fact of capture, and women's previous marriage is immediately annulled. Okay? When a child or woman is taken captive, they become slaves by the fact of capture. Now, this is the terminology that is being used, but what it really means is they become prisoners of war. But we don't put our prisoners of war in Guantanamo Bay, and we don't put our prisoners of war in cages. We bring them back to society. So the Amir of Jihad, basically, you know, uh, he, like Imam Nawi talks about, the he does hiba, okay? He gifts to, like, he's the Amir of Jihad, and now they have captives, okay? What do they do with these captives? Well, the first thing that they would do is try to ransom them. Hey, you give us 10 of yours, we'll give you 10 of our, the 10 we have of yours, and you give us 10 of ours, and we'll exchange. Now, a lot of times in this situation, they would exchange the men, but not exchange the women. So the Amir of Jihad says, okay, look, the battle is over, we won, we have X number of principles, uh, we have X number of captives, or prisoners of war. We don't put our prisoners of war in jail. But what we do is, the Amir of Jihad can distribute them according to the foreign policy of Islam. Now, what is the foreign policy of Islam? It is the propagation of Islam, okay? And whatever is good for the propagation of Islam. So, according to the foreign policy of Islam, he gives the women to the men accordingly. That man takes that woman to the house and he says to his wife, you know, the Amir of Jihad gave me the responsibility of this lady. Can you talk to her? Now, whatever is the understanding between the man and his wife, meaning the husband and the wife, on whether... You know, they have a relationship, they don't have a relationship. Uh, that is up to the uh, the husband-wife relationship at that point. But the Amir of Jihad gave it to her that this is your responsibility to take care of her and to culture her, 
in the Islamic culture. So she'll start eating the Islamic food. She'll start hearing the adhan. She'll start hearing, you know, she will be in that culture and with those women. And she'll have her responsibilities over there. And the other advantage of this is when she comes under the protection of this man. So, you know, let's say there is a village that some uh, cap, caps, captives came. Okay, And some of those captives are women. And so now uh, every man's like, oh, look at that, you know, this captive that came. She might, some young men might uh, have eyes on her or they might have, you know, like her. So because the putting in prison is one problem, but the bringing her into a society, the problem would be that other eyes might be on her. So, but when it's a, when she comes into the Muslim society, into the Muslim family, and everyone knows she's under the protection of such and such guy, and they don't know what the arrangements are, right? It's a personal matter. She, they could be having intimacy. They could not be having intimacy. You know, they could be thinking of getting married. They might not be thinking of getting married. No one knows that. So the other guys, they keep their eyes away because they know she is under the protection of another man, okay? So, I just wanted that to be clear. Uh, when a child or a woman is taken captive, they become slaves by the fact of capture and women's previous marriage is immediately annulled. When an adult male is taken captive, the caliph considers the interests, meaning the maslaha. Okay? He considers the maslaha and decides between the prisoner's death, slavery, release without paying anything or ransoming him himself in exchange for money or for other, a Muslim captive. Uh, held by the enemy if the prisoner becomes a muslim okay if the prisoner becomes a muslim uh before the the caliph chooses any of the four alternatives then he may not be killed and one of the four other alternatives is chosen okay it is permissible in jihad to cut down enemies trees and destroying their dwellings as you will see later on, that there's a hadith of the Prophet not to destroy buildings, but we'll come to that later on. Truces. Um, as for truces, the author does not mention them, meaning the uh, in the sacred law, truce means a peace treaty with hostile that those hostile to Islam involving cessation of fighting for a period of time whether for payment or something else. The scriptural basis for them includes the Quranic verse, an acquittal, acquittal from Allah and His Messenger. Okay? Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, min Allahi wa rasulu. And if any, in, if they incline towards peace, then incline towards them, Allah says. Okay? So, bara'atum min Allahi wa rasuli. Allah is free from you and His Messenger, meaning from making peace from having any peace especially at Fatul al-Makkah this was now that is specific to Fatul al-Makkah but the other the other ayah that if they want to make peace make peace right then that is encouraged in the Quran as well as the truth of which the Prophet sallallahu made with the Quraysh in the year of Hudaybiyah as related by Bukhari and Muslim truces are permissible permissible not obligatory the only one who may affect a truce is the Muslim ruler of a region with a segment of non-Muslims of the region or the caliph, okay? When made with other than the portion of the non-Muslims, when made with other than a portion of the non-Muslims who, when made with all of them or with all of the particular persons such as India or Asia Minor, then only the caliph representative affected. For it is a matter of grave, great, gravest consequence because it entails the non-performance of jihad. Whether globally or in a given locality, and our interests may be looked after therein, which is why it is best left to the caliph under the circumstances and to someone he delegates to see the interests of the various regions. Now, uh, this is another point that is very uh, important. You know, uh, I talk about this uh, a lot, but I'll mention it again, is that it's, it doesn't work if you put a part of a Toyota car and try to put it into a Mitsubishi car, okay? It doesn't work. So if you have a secular state and you try to have some Islamic laws, well, you can fool yourself, but that is not going to give you the... Because either the whole system is there or it's not, it's, it's not going to 
be there, right? So if you like, uh, so sometimes because of if you have this mixture between Islam and secularism, then even the Islamic rules sometimes have a double negative effect, okay? And so, um, anyway, let's continue. There must be, in, there, so, but another point that I want to make here is that when he is saying that the caliph may decide what's in the interest of Islam's foreign policy and the propagation of Islam, okay? So there, there's a lot of flexibility here depending upon the situation, the circumstances, what is the maslaha, what is the benefit, what has the greater benefit, okay? So the, all these things need to be kept in view when you're uh, dealing in jihad uh, and particularly when it comes to having treaties. Like, for example, the people don't generally know this, but the Prophet wasallam he made a treaty of Hudaybiyah, but he didn't renew it. Because when it was in the interest of Islam to have the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet did it, وسلم, and he kept its word. But after the treaty, treaty was broken, the Prophet was asked to, re, to renegotiate the treaty, and the Prophet didn't renegotiate. Abu Sufyan came from Mecca to Medina specifically to negotiate with the Prophet وسلم, to negotiate a new peace treaty, and the Prophet didn't do it. So it's based upon the maslaha of the Muslims, okay? There must be some interest served in making a truce other than mere preservation of status quo. Allah Most High says, So do not be faint-hearted and call for peace when it is you are when you are given the upper hand. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, don't just uh, do peace because you're a coward. Okay? Interests that justify making a peace truce are such things as Muslims, weakness, in interests that justify making a peace truce are such things as Muslim weakness because of lack of numbers or material, or the hope of an enemy becoming Muslim. For the Prophet ﷺ made a truce in the year of Makkah, in, in, in the year Makkah was liberated with Safwan ibn Umayyah for four months in hope that he would become Muslim, and he entered Islam before its time was up. If the Muslims are weak, a truce may be made for 10 years if necessary. Imam Shafi particularly has this rule where he puts a limit of 10 years because the Prophet did it for 10 years. Okay, He would prefer something less, but the limit he puts is 10 years and he takes Hudaybiyah as his model, 10 years it is. Okay, So no negotiations of peace more than 10 years. Because why? Because for him, he's looking at it from the foreign policy. We have to propagate Islam. If we have peace treaty, then you know you can't really propagate Islam so we need to propagate Islam and the only way you could propagate Islam in those times was if you brought your army to show them basically what is Islam so if Muslims are weak a truce may be made for 10 years if necessary for the Prophet Sallallahu made a truce with the Quraysh for that long it is related by Abu Dawud it is not permissible to stipulate longer than that save by means of new truces each of which does not exceed 10 years okay so Imam Shafi'i, the way he's seeing it is, okay, uh, you know, we will have peace only for as long as we need to. After that, <laughs> we're not going to have uh, peace the, uh, uh, because our foreign policy is ideological. Our foreign policy is Islam. The ruling of such a truce is uh, inferable from those of the non-Muslim poll tax. Namely, that when a valid truce has been effected, no harm may be done to non-Muslims until it expires. Okay. A free Muslim who has reached puberty and is sane is entitled to the spoils of battle when he has participated in a battle to the end of it. Okay. So even though uh, Uthman radiallahu anh, there's an example of his time where there was a battle done uh, near uh, Uzbekistan, Khorasan area, and there, they, uh, the match seemed pretty tight, right? So they called for reinforcements. Now those reinforcements are coming, and by the time they had reached there, the army that was there initially had uh, had victory over the the enemy. So now when this ar this backup army came. They also demanded the spoils of war, and they also demanded, you know, the rights of the Muslims, because they're like, well, we were on our way, and, you know, we made this journey, so we should be given 
a portion. And this is what Uthman radiallahu anh agreed to. But anyway, um, a free Muslim who has reached puberty and is sane is entitled to the spoils of the battle when he has participated in a battle to the end of it. So this um, Uthman radiallahu anh has a different opinion than this. After personal booty, the collective spoils of the battle are divided into five parts. The first, fifth, is set aside, and the remaining four are distributed. One share to each infantryman, three shares to each calv cavalry uh, men. From these latter four fifths also, a token payment is given to the leaders, discretion to women, children, and non-Muslim participants on the Muslim side. Okay, so based upon the type of weapons you have, you can say, now this would be interesting to negotiate this in the modern times, but if you have, ca ca you know, uh, cavalry, you have the horses, and everything, you get three shares, okay? Um, so the, uh, after the personal booty, the collective spoils of the battle are divided into five parts, okay, five even parts, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, and is set aside. The remaining four, uh, a fifth is, is is set aside, so 20% is set aside. The remaining four are distributed, one share to each infantryman, three shares to the one who has cavalry men. From these latter four fifths also, a, take, a token payment is given at the leader's discretion to women, children, and non-Muslim participants on the Muslim side. Okay? Now, a convent only takes possession of his share of spoils at the official division, meaning there has to be an official division in which the Amir of Jihad uh, with his witnesses, he does this counting and he sab of everything and then divides it accordingly. Okay. Um, and then he says, as for a personal booty, anyone, uh, any anyone who, despite resistance, killed any of the enemy or effectively incapacitates him, risking his own life, thereby is entitled to whatever he can take from the enemy, meaning as much as he can take away from him in the battle, such as a mound, clothing, weaponry, money, and other. Okay, so one is uh, the stuff that you know you're fighting someone one on one, uh, like many times in modern times, you see somebody you know shoot someone. Okay, so now that person died, and you're running out of ammunition, you can take his uh, shield, you can take his, uh, you can take his armor, you can take his gun, you can take whatever he has that will help you, uh, either in monetary terms, or help you continue fighting, okay? So that's pers at the personal level, but then there is the collective level, okay? At the collective level, uh, that is the spoils that are brought all together, okay? So that is, there's one that, one is during the battle, one on one what is happening, okay? And then one is after the battle, everything that remains is like put in a pile and then distributed according to, uh, to people, accordingly. As for personal booty, anyone who despite resistance kill, kills any one of the enemies or effectively incapacitates him, risking his own life, thereby entitled to whatever he can take from the enemy, meaning as much as he can take away from him in battle, such as amount, clothing, weaponry, money, and other. I meaning you can take the other person's horse even, right, to, um, to continue fighting. As for the first fifth, it is taken from the spoils. It is divided into five parts, a share going to... Number one, the Prophet Sallallahu Now there's a lot of debate what to do with the money that was the, sh the, the, the share of the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after his death to the Islamic interests as fortifying defenses on the frontiers, uh, salaries for Islamic ju judges, muazzins and the like. Okay. Um, so then number two, relatives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the Bani Hashim and Bani Mutlib clans. Now, this is, uh, you know, the, the Shafi opinion that includes Bani Mutlib. Most of them say only Bani Hashim. But each male receiving a share of two females. Orphans who are poor is the third por portion. Uh, those short of money. Travelers needing money. Uh, Non-Muslim subjects 
in, of the Islamic State. A formal agreement of protection is made with citizens who are Christians, J Jews, Zoroastrians, uh, Sabians, Sumerians, if their religions do not respectively contradict the fundamental basis of Judaism and in Christianity. And though, meaning it's about analogy, right? So, like, for example, if your religion is like Christianity, but you're not part of the initial, those people Allah was addressing uh, in the Quran in terms of in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and so you're one of the other religious groups, but you're very close to Christianity, then, you know, you would be treated the same way. Um, Sumerians and Sabians, if religions do not respectively contradict the fundamental basis of Judaism and Christianity, those who adhere to the religion of Abraham alayhi salatu wasalam, and those of the other prophets, peace be upon him, peace be upon them. Such an agreement, such an agreement may not be affected with those who are idol worshippers. Or those who have not do not have a sacred book or something that could have been uh, could have been a book. Now this is interesting because the Hindus they have the Vedas, right? Whereas the Quraysh of Mecca had no book. So they were uh, you could say within the polytheists there are also different groups. One is a group that has a sacred book, and the polytheists that have no sacred book. The, the polytheists that have no sacred book are are the pagan worshippers of Quraysh, basically. Something that could have been a book refers to like those of Zoroastrians who have remnants resembling an ancient book. As for the pseudo-scriptures of cults that have uh, appeared since Islam, such as the Sikhs, Babais, Mormons, Qadianis, they neither are nor could be a book, since the Quran is the final revelation. Such an agreement is only valid when subject uh, with the subject peoples. Follow the rules of Islam, those mentioned below, and those involving public behavior and dress. Though in acts of worship, their private lives subject, the subject communities have their own laws, judges, courts, enforcing the rules of their own religion amongst themselves. So now this is a very important point, which is that uh, when Islam is enforced in a land, Islam does not force people to live by our rules. But you want to get divorced, go to your own courts. Islam forced Christians to form their own courts so that Muslim courts will not judge over Christians, for example. So they form their own courts, they form their own judiciary, they formulate their own laws, and then the personal law of, of a person's life they do according to their religion, right? Uh, follow the rules of Islam, those mentioned below, and those involving the public behavior, the dress, acts of worship, and their private lives. The subject communities have their own laws, judges, courts, enforcing the rules of their own religion among themselves, and pay the Muslim poll tax. Okay, so, uh, you can't, the Muslim poll tax is for the non-Muslims who we take responsibility of, they will not be part of the Muslim army as the Ottomans did. They will, um, you know, so just keep that in mind. The minimum non-Muslim poll tax is one dinar, okay, per person. Maximum is whatever both sides agree upon. So again, even when you're negotiating with them, you have to have the mercy that you're negotiating with them according to their means. It is collected with leniency and politeness as with as all, all as all debts and is not levied on women, children, or the insane. Such non Muslim because Allah says don't give your wealth to the foolish. So if somebody's insane and you're gonna give him your wealth, well, if you lose it, it's on you. Such non Muslim subjects are obligated to comply with Islamic rules that pertain to the safety and the indemnity of the of life reputation and property in addition they are penalized for committing adultery or theft though not for drunkenness are distinguished from muslims in dress and wearing a wide cloth belt um, are not greeted with assalamu alaikum so uh, in addition meaning the non-muslims okay so how are they uh, treated differently 
This is what is being talked about. Such non-Muslim subjects are obliged to comply with Islamic rules that pertain to the safety and the indemnity of life, reputation, and property. In addition, so now this is especially true in Arabia, to whom the Prophet was specifically sent, so this has to be clear, or the garrison cities in which Muslims were majority Arabs and, you know, they had their own independent city and you're coming into this independent city are penalized for com committing adultery or theft, though not for drunkenness, are distinguished from Muslims in dress, wear a wide cloth belt, are not greeted with Aslamu alaikum, must keep to the side of the street, may not build higher than or as high as the Muslim buildings, though if they if they require acquire a tall house, it is not raised, okay, are forbidden to openly display wine pork, to ring church bells or to d display crosses, recite the Torah or Injil out loud, make public display of funerals, and uh, make public display of funerals or feast days. They're not allowed to do that. Are forbidden to build new churches. Okay, so they're able to keep their old churches, but they're not able to build new churches in, in that land that's been uh, conquered, or uh, depending upon the situation. They are forbidden to reside in Hijaz, meaning the area and towns around Mecca and Medina and Yamama, for more than three days. Okay, if the Caliph allows them to enter there, enter there for something they need. So you can't. Uh, it's if you are a non-believer, you cannot enter the area of Mecca and surrounding areas uh, by Islamic law. Uh, a non-Muslim may not enter Meccan sacred presence uh, under any circumstances or enter uh, any other mosque without permission may not may not muslims uh, may not muslims enter churches without their permission so it's the same muslims cannot and then when the islamic state is established somewhere then muslims cannot enter the churches without their permission it is obligatory for the caliph to protect those of them who are in muslim lands just as he would Muslims and to seek the release of those who are captured. Okay, so th these are amongst the rights of the non-Muslims to protect them uh, that are in the Muslim lands, just as he would protect uh, Muslims. So in the Muslim lands, they're equal in terms of protection, and to seek the, uh, to seek the release of those who are captured. So even if they're captured and they're non-Muslims, the Muslim state, the Islamic state, will work on freeing them. If non-Muslim subjects of the Islamic State refuse to conform to the rules of Islam or to pay the non-Muslim poll, poll, poll tax, meaning jizya, then their agreement with the state is also violated. So if a non-Muslim subjects of the Islamic State refuse to conform to the rules of Islam or pay the jizya, then their agreement with the state has been violated. Though if only of a uh, Though, though it only one of them obeys, it concerns uh, him alone. The agreement is also violated with respect to the uh, the offender alone if the state has stipulated that any of the following conditions break it, and one of the subjects does uh, does so anyway. Though, though it the state though, if the state has not just has stipulated that. These break the agreement, then they do not name, uh, namely, if one of the uh, subject people. So they have to keep to the promises they've made, and if the pro if it's not a stipulation, then they're free as far as that's concerned. Commits adultery with a Muslim woman or marries her, uh, conceals spies of hostile forces, uh, it leads a Muslim away from Islam kills a Muslim, mentions something impermissible about Allah and his messenger is snap. Okay, so this is what Imam Shafi says. When a subject's agreement with the state has been violated, the Caliph chooses between four alternatives mentioned above in connection with prisoners of war. So this is the Kitab al-Jihad by, uh, in the Shafi'i Fiqh. Okay, this is the, um, this is, the uh, introduction to that. So, Bismillah. Now we will talk uh, based upon the rulings of jihad on in Badayat al-Mujtahid. 
and we will read the book of jihad there. I will try to make it as quickly as possible, inshallah ta'ala. The book of jihad, a comprehensive discussion of the principles of this subject, is covered in two chapters. The first is about the identification of the elements of war. The second is about the ahkam of the enemy's property when Muslims come to own it. Okay, chapter one is the arkan of the war. Basically, arkan is, uh, let me explain that to you. Um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a hukum, right, do this, especially in the Hanafi fiqh, this is more true in the Hanafi fiqh than any other fiqh. That if Allah gave a hukum, it has to be followed by categories or parts. So for example, Allah gave the hukum to pray, right? So if the if the hukum to pray is really a hukum, a really a command from Allah, then it will also have parts. Because this shows that there was a command that was given, and then with the command, it's different things you have to do in regards to that command. There's no If you just give a command, then it can be a, a recommendation, right? For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Sutul Jumma, وَإِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ No, sorry, Allah, فَانْتَشِرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Right? When the prayer, Jumma prayer is done, then فَانْتَشِرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ It's a command. Go around the earth and... Uh, 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 and then seek the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean that you have to leave Jama'ah and uh, seek the bounty because it was just an encouragement. You don't have to stay there, but now you did the dhikr of Allah, you completed it, go seek the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if Allah gives a command like pray, and then Allah mentions its categories. Look, you have to do ruku, you have to do sujood, you have to do this. Now it's absolutely clear this is a hukum. Now these parts that are part of a hukam means uh, it, it meaning that it could be sunnah but it means that it's it's a hukam okay there's a clear hukam there is 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 the point the elements are can, are can of war there's seven sections in this chapter the first is about the identification of the hukam of this activity and the persons for whom it is binding the second is about the identification of the persons who are to be fought the third is about the identification of each category of the enemy on whom harm may be inflicted and those who are not to be hurt fourth is about law is the lawful conditions of war fifth is about the identification of the number of opponents from uh, from whom retreat is not possible. Sixth relates to whether truce is possible. Seventh deals with the question of why wage jihad or why wage war. Okay, so now uh, let us continue with this identification of the hukum of this activity, meaning what makes this activity obligatory. We're going to find some of the many of the same topics being mentioned, but there are many other topics here that are not mentioned in. With respect to the hukum of this activity, meaning what is the hukum? Is it fard? Is it sunnah? You know, what type of fard is it? So on and so forth. The jurists unanimously agree that it is a collective and not a universal obligation except for uh, Abdullah bin Hassan radiallahu anh, who said it is voluntary, meaning it, it, is, uh, it is not a fard. The majority of the jurists adopted this view because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alaykum al qital. War, fighting has been ordained for you. Uh, and as, uh, it, even though you dislike it. Maybe you dislike something, but it is good for you. Maybe you love something, but it's bad for you. And Allah knows and you don't know. It's imposition as a communal obligation, meaning fardul kafaya. That is, when some undertake it and the rest are absolved of it is based upon the words of Allah exalt, the exalt, Allah, uh, of Allah exalt, the exalted the believers should not all go out to fight of every troop of them a party go only should go forth and that they that are left behind may gain sound knowledge in the deen and that they may warn their folk when they return Okay, so this is actually the ayah that uh, sometimes when you get an Islamic certificate of knowledge, this is the tafaqahu fid deen, that a group of them goes and does the fighting, and then people, people stay behind, and they learn the deen, and when they meet them, they warn them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this kind of like cycle, uh, that they may beware, and his words, unto each Allah hath promised a good, but he hath bestowed on those who strive a great reward above those that are sitting. 
Okay. Further, the Prophet وسلم, never went out to battle unless he had left some people behind. Taken together, all these evidence imply that this activity constitutes a collective obligation, meaning there is a collective goal that needs to be met and for which there's a collective work. Okay. The activity is obligatory on men who are free, have obtained puberty, who find the means at their disposal for going to war are of sound health and are neither ill nor suffer from chronic disease. There is no dispute about this because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no blame for the blind, nor there is blame for the lame, nor is there blame for the sick. And his words, uh, not unto the weak, nor unto the sick, nor those who can find not to spend is, uh, is any fault. Uh, then with respect to the obligation being restricted to free men, I know of no disagreement. With respect to the obligation being restricted to free men, I know of no disagreement. Meaning free men are the ones that have this uh, responsibility of jihad primarily. The jurists in generally agree that a condition for this obligation is the permission of the parents, except when it comes to uh, when it becomes a universal obligation, for example, when there are not enough people to carry out the obligation unless uh, all present undertake it. Now this is uh, very important because establishing the Khilafah is, you can say, a uh, Fardul Kafaya. But if you see there's not enough people working for Khilafah, if you see not enough people are there to try and establish the justice of Islam, then it, is, it becomes an obligation even upon you if you have the knowledge that this is not being done. Okay? Uh, now, the uh, activities, uh, then uh, the jurists in general agreed that a condition of this obligation is, per, is the permission of the parents, except when it becomes a universal obligation, for example, when there's not enough people to carry out the obligation unless all present undertake it. The basis for this is the estab established tradition relate, which relates that a person said to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wish to participate in jihad, and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are your parents alive? He said, yes, he said, then struggle in their cause, okay? Or there are similar narrations uh, like this in, that have the same meaning. Uh, jurists disagree about the need for the con consent of polytheist parents, meaning if the parents are mushrik, then do you need their uh, uh, permission? Similarly, they disagreed about the consent of the creditor when a person is under debt because of the saying of the Prophet wasallam when a man asked, will, uh, will Allah pardon my sins if I die with forbearance, sacrificing myself in the way of Allah? The Prophet wasallam said, yes, except for debts. That is what Jibreel said to me lately. The majority permit it, however, particularly when the person leaves something behind for satisfaction of his debts. So, um, it can be allowed if the debtor, the person who gave the loan, said, yeah, you can go for jihad, if you die, I forgive you, right? And uh, then others said, no, if there's a debt, you can't go. And so parents and debt are like two things that are discussed when it comes to permission of a sane Muslim who's an adult. Identification of the persons to be fought. Jurists agree with respect to the person who are to be fought that they are all of the polytheists, meaning mushrikeen, because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fight them until there's no persecution, there's no persecution, until persecution is no more, and the religion is all for Allah, except what is narrated from Imam Malik, who said it is not permitted to commence hostilities against uh, Ethiopians nor against the Turks. Because of the report of, from the Prophet Wasallam, leave the Ethiopians in peace as long as they leave you alone. Malik was questioned about the authenticity of this tradition. He did not he did not acknowledge it, but said people continue to avoid an attack on them. Meaning, there's also the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, don't wish to meet your enemy, right? So now we have this uh, situation before us that the Prophet said, don't wish to meet your enemy, but on the other side, the only way that you could propagate Islam in those days was with uh, bringing your army to the town and then, you know, introducing Islam uh, that way. And so this kind of like, this has been a part of the uh, conversation, okay? So, but Imam Malik basically, um, he was of the opinion that there's no need to commence something. Now, 
uh, as far as uh, certain lands are concerned, uh, you know, ish, uh, the sh mushriks are not even allowed there, right? So Jaziratul Arab, Jazirat al Arab is one of those lands. We can disagree about Sham, if that includes, Dr. Zaid would say that yes, that includes that. Identification of the harm permitted to be inflicted upon the enemy. Harm allowed to be inflicted upon the enemy can be to property, life, personal liberty, that is enslavement and ownership. Harm that amounts to the enslavement is permitted by way of consensus for all categories of polytheists. So all categories of polytheists, those that are Arabs, remember we talked about Arab polytheists versus non-Arab polytheists in the previous book. So Arab polytheists, because the Prophet was sent specifically to them, so that's like the most uh, highest level. Uh, I mean they're men and women, old and young and common and among uh, the common people and the elite with the exception of monks. No one group of jurists maintain that the monks are to be left alone and not to be captured. In fact, they are to be left unharmed and not to be enslaved because of the saying of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leave them to that which they devoted themselves. And also because of the practice of, this was the practice of, of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. The majority of the jurists maintained that the Imam has different types of choices regarding the prisoners of war, including their pardon, enslavement, execution, demand for ransom, the imposition of jizya on them. A group of jurists maintained that it is not permitted to execute the prisoners. Uh, so some of the jurists, they said, you can't execute the prisoners. Uh, Hassan ibn uh, Tamimi related that there is a consensus of ijma of the companions on this, meaning the, the ijma of the Sahaba is you cannot kill uh, the prisoners. Now, if you notice that when Imam Shafi, uh, the Shafi fiqh is talking about this, it does give certain conditions regarding this that we already went through. Okay. The reason for their disagreement stems from the conflict of the apparent meaning of the verse in this context, the conflict of of acts of the Prophet ﷺ and the conflict of the apparent meaning of the Quranic text with the acts of the Prophet ﷺ. This is because the apparent meaning of the word of Allah, the exalted, now when you meet them in the battle, those who disbelieve, then it is the smiting of the next until when you have routed them and it is after taking prisoners, the Imam can only pardon or take ransom. Okay, so, uh, so basically the issue is the issue is when can you take them as prisoners and so over here in the ayah it says when you meet them in battle those who disbelieve then it is the smiting of necks until you have routed them it is after taking prisoners the imam can pardon or take ransom with uh, this conflicts with the words of allah it is not for any prophet to have captives until he has uh, the word in this english translation is uh, 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 until he is slaughtered in land or until he's brought them down okay uh, and the prophet to have captives until he made a slaughter in the land and with the occasion of now remember uh, over here where it talks about the prophet where it talks about the prophet is specific to the prophet Meaning, the Prophet has to, I and my messenger have to prevail. And to whom the Prophet was sent, that Islam has to be established there. This is specific to him, even though it's general. In a sense, we have to bring Islam, and there was no way to bring Islam in the previous years, except by armies, right? So, um, and that is not to say we can't do the same now. But for that, you have to establish Khilafah. Not these uh, secular regimes. You know, not these uh, secular Turkey and Pakistan. These regimes are secular regimes. They don't have anything to do with Islam. Okay? They have, they, they, they don't have the Islamic flag. They don't have the flag of the Prophet ﷺ. They don't have Liwa. They don't have Riwa. They don't have the flag of the Prophet. They don't have the rules of the Prophet. They don't, they don't have, their banking system is based upon Riba. So, you know, changing mosques and this and that, you can have, do cosmetic stuff to make yourself feel religious. But that's, there's no Islam there at all. Okay? So, uh, it is not for any prophet to have captives until he hath made slaughter in the land and with the occasion of the re revelation that indicates that the case of the prisoners of the Badr, the, ex the execution is better than enslavement. What happened here was, is that uh, Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ, they felt 
to keep them as prisoners is better and umar when felt that no to kill them off is better and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided in the opinion of umar that it is not for a prophet to do this okay and so the next time the prophet sallallahu didn't do the same thing he did that he did in Badr. okay uh and with the occasion of Rebel indicates that the case of the prisoners of the battle of Badr, that the execution is better than the enslavement the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam however executed the prisoners on some occasions and pardoned them on others and enslaved women so women are not to be executed they are to be brought to the muslim families to the culture to the society and uh, cultured in the islamic uh, way you can say uh, abu ubaid has related that he never enslaved a free male a free male arabs the companions after him uh, agreed upon the permissibility of enslavement of the people of the book both male and female those who maintained that the verse which is specific about the matter of the captives prohibiting execution has uh, has abrogated the acts of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the captives are not to be executed so on one ayah it's saying look no captives another ayah is saying take captives right but the one ayah that says no captives is specific to the prophet but if you keep that out and make it general that it's general then you'll say okay no captives and then captives so they're saying the verse that says no captives has been replaced by the verse that allows captives so there's this kind of like uh, uh, n debate about Nasikh and Mansukh. Those who maintain that the verse which is specific about the matter of captives has been abrogated, has abrogated the acts of the Prophet, uh, said that the captive is not to be executed. Those who maintain that the verse neither mentions captives nor is its purpose the final disposal of the question of what is to be done to the captives and that the act of the Prophet ﷺ is in addition to what is in the verse when they take into account the censor or of the failure to execute the captives said that the execution of the captives is permitted meaning the prophet didn't do it but because allah allowed allah said it would have been better if you did it if you killed them so therefore it is allowed so execution is permitted in cases where guarantee of safe conduct is not available okay so if you uh you can execute them if there is no uh, peace, there's no uh, uh, safe uh, uh, guarantee of safe conduct. Okay, there is no disagreement amongst Muslims on this, however, they differ as to who can grant safe conduct and who cannot. They agreed on the permissibility of safe conduct granted by the Imam. So, uh, if uh, the Imam uh, uh, gives the, the permission, then it's allowed. Okay, the majority of the jurors permitted safe conduct granted by free Muslim males, except uh, uh, except some of them, okay, um, was the view that it is contingent upon the consent of the Imam. They disagreed about the safe conduct granted by a slave or a woman. So basically, if somebody is a Muslim and he says, I give protection to this non-Muslim, he could be a pagan, idol worshiper, Christian, Jew, right? Who has the right to say, which Muslims have the right to say that? Okay, this is the question. Majority of the jurists permitted safe conduct granted by free Muslim males, except by Ibn al Majushan, who was of the view that it is contingent upon the consent of the Imam. They disagreed about the safe conduct granted by a slave or a woman. The majority permitted it this, uh, and the others used to say that safe conduct granted by women is contingent upon the consent of the Imam. Abu Hanifa said that safe conduct granted by a slave is not permitted unless it, it, it is unless he participates in fighting. So Abu Hanifa's position is anyone who is in the battle could give another non-Muslim uh, protection. The reason for their disagreement is the conflict of a general implication of the analogical reasoning. Generally, in the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, the blood of the Muslim has equal value among themselves among themselves with respect to protection even the humblest endeavors of their collective protection against outsiders they form a single hand this implies though is generally that safe conduct granted by a slave is valid okay because if a slave is muslim then he's equal to all muslims as the prophet said the conflicting analogy arises due to the fact that the safe conduct is contingent upon full legal capacity while the capacity of the slave is deficient due to his 
of his being a slave. Thus it is necessary that the slave should be an, be effective in invalidating invalidating his a man on the analogy of its effectiveness in suspending many of the legal ahkam in his case. Well, you know, if there's a slave and he has a master and he says, I'm giving these people protection and his master says, no, 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 you cannot. So this will be a conflict uh, between the two. And so is he really in a position to give somebody uh, a man? The disagreement about the effectiveness of the safe conduct granted by women is based upon the, their dispute about the meaning of the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he's, we grant, we grant protect, we protect whom you have protected, O Ummuhani. Ummuhani is the sister of Ali radiallahu anh. So the Prophet says, O Ummuhani, whoever you protect, we've, if you've granted them protection, we're, we're giving them protection. Okay? On the analogy of women upon women. Okay? Those who understood from this saying, we protect whom you have protected, O Ummuhani, an endorsement of safe conduct granted by her, is nor its validity by itself, for it had been for had it not been for his endorsement, meaning had the Prophet not as the Amir, as the Imam, as the Khalifa had said, you know, we give protection to those who you give protection. So therefore, if it's a woman, you need an Imam's pr protection over her. So for her to be able to give somebody protection. Her guarantee of safe conduct would be ineffective, said uh, that a woman cannot grant safe conduct unless it is endorsed by the Imam. Those who understood from this that the, his endorsement of her was with the view that the aman had already been concluded and had taken effect and not with the view that it was his endorsement that granted validity to its conclusion said that the safe conduct guaranteed by woman is permitted so uh, was it the fact that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as an amir gave her and therefore after he said hey we give protection to those who you give protection and the prophet is therefore validating what she is already did or did the Prophet say this in order to validate what she was doing? Meaning, uh, the Prophet said this as an Amir or as somebody that was encouraging her as a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so, uh, those who understood from this the endorsement of her was that the view that the uh, a man had already been concluded and had already taken effect and not with a view that it, that his endorsement that generally validated to its conclusion said that safe conduct granted by woman is permitted. Likewise, those who considered equal to a man by the way of analogy and made no distinction between them permitted safe conduct by, granted by her, while those who considered that she had a legal defect, she's legally uh, defective as compared to men, did not permit such safe conduct. Because women also usually are under men, and so if there's a dispute, she says, I give you safe conduct, but her husband says no, or her father says no, so she doesn't have that legal authority, that legal power to say this, according to some of the fuqaha, and others then say, no, she has the right, just like any other man, and the hadith is there to prove that. Whatever the nature of the amin is, it is not effective in according to protection against enslavement, but only against ex execution. Okay, so uh, whatever the case, it will protect a person against being executioned, but will not protect them against slavery. Now, of course, we have to have a whole discussion about ma malakat aymanukum, what your right hands possess, what is meant by slavery. It is not meant by slavery what the American experience of black slaves was. That's not what, it was a practical thing. It was a useful thing. This is why Allah says what your right hand possesses, because it was a practical thing. Basically, you're under my protection. That's what. It, that's all it means. And that under this protection, I give you protection and you give me something in return. That's all it is, okay? So I'll just leave it at that for now, at least for this discussion. Uh, it, so whatever the nature of the amount is, it is not effective in affording protection against enslavement. So they can get enslaved, meaning you could say, technically, the Amir of Jihad or whoever uh, could say, look, uh, you know, they, 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 I, everything will have to happen through the Amir of Jihad, okay? And the Amir of Jihad would then say, okay, you know, these these people have given protection, they, they need to go and be the slaves of X, Y, Z. And then that would be somehow figured out. Is it possible for us to relate this disagreement uh, to their dispute about words used for the masculine plural, whether they include the women, it, that is, in accordance with legal usage? Meaning, when the Prophet says something in the masculine plural, it includes male and female. Like it says, that's masculine. That includes men and women. Okay? 
The harm aimed at life is by killing, and there is no disagreement among Muslim jurists that it is permitted in war to slay male polytheists who have obtain, attained puberty and are waging war. There are, however, disagreement about execution after captivity, as we have already discussed. So in the battle, there is no disagreement. If you're fighting against a mushrik, a polytheist, a pagan person, you kill him in battle, that's it. That's fine. There is, however, there is disagreement about the execution after captivity, as we have already discussed. Similarly, there is no dispute about them that it is not permitted to slay minors or women as long as they are not waging war. If if a woman fights in in shedding her blood, it be, shedding her blood becomes permissible. This is established as the Prophet wasallam prohibited killing of women and children and said when he saw a slain woman, she was not one who would have engaged in fighting. So the Prophet saw a woman who was slain and the Prophet basically said, you shouldn't have killed her. She wouldn't have engaged in fighting. Okay? They disagreed about the case of hermits cut off from the world, the blind, the chronically ill, the old who cannot fight, the idiot, the peasants, the serfs. Malik said neither the blind nor the idiots nor the her hermits are to be slain. And enough of their wealth is to be left uh, to them by which they may survive. Similarly, old and discrepant are not to be slain in his view. And this was also the view of Abu Hanifa and his disciples. Thawri and Awzai said that only the old are spared. Awzai added that the peasants are not to be slain either. According to Imam Shafi, the most authentic opinion of his, all of these categories are to be put to death. Okay, The basis for disagreement stems from the conflict of the specificity in some traditions with the general implication of some of the Quranic verses and also the generality of the authentic sayings of the Prophet وسلم, I've been commanded to fight people until they say La ilaha illallah now this has to be clear okay and this is why what is being talked about by Imam Shafi'i specifically is Arab polytheists okay Arab polytheists okay the basis for the disagreement stems from the conflict of their uh, specif uh, specificity in some traditions in which the Prophet has said I have been commanded to fight mankind until they say la ilaha illallah the words of the exalted then when the sacred months have passed Allah said slay the idolaters wherever you find them okay implying uh, that implying the slaying of the uh, of every non-believer whether he be a monk or not. Now, this is specific to the mushriks, the pagan wor worshippers. But the ayahs in Sutta Tawbah are also very, very specific, very, very specific to the Prophet ﷺ. Because those same verses, uh, I will show you, uh, say that, you know, you can give, that the Prophet, because he came as a Prophet, and just like Nud or Hud, when he came as a Prophet, he gave them four months, either to accept or die. Okay, so those parts should not be conf confused with other parts of the Quran. Okay, so let me just uh, just clarify this for you. So Allah says, min Allah wa rasuli ilal min al Allah and His Messenger declared complete independence from the promises, the, prom the covenant that had been made with the the treaties that had been made with the polytheists. That was Sunnatul Hudaybiyah for ten years. But because they broke the contract, now Allah declared, that's it. No more contracts with them. Now, what is their case? This is Fatul Makkah. Okay. Fasiru fil ard arbata ashkur. Travel on the earth four months. Wa'lamu and know it well. Annakum ghayra mu'azillah. You cannot escape from Allah. Okay. You cannot, uh, you cannot cause failure to Allah. When Allah but Allah will cause failure to the disbelievers. Look, this is now the uh, in the day of Hajj. Okay, Abu Bakr is there and he's announcing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Prophet is announcing to the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that what now you have four months. And uh, it is being announced in Tuptu Fahuwa Khairulakum. If you do repentance, that's better for you. Wa in tawalaytum fa'lamu anna ghayra mu'azilla. If you turn away, you cannot uh, you cannot outdo Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Wa bashin ladina kafaru bi adabun alim and give the good news for the disbelievers of adabun adabun alim means punishment in this world and the next world. Okay. So uh then 
إلا الذين آهدتم من المشركين ثم لم ينقصوكم شيئا except for the people of the mushrikeen that you made a promise to them okay and and they kept their promise then ولم يظهروا عليكم أحدا and they didn't try to break their promises over you or have authority over you فأتموا عليهم أحدهم so complete your promise your your covenant with them for whatever time it is right إلى مدتهم to the to, uh, to the time that it's supposed so let's say the contract is for one year two years but after that they have four months to decide what are they going to do accept Islam or not accept Islam إن الله يحب المتقين Allah loves those, loves those people who are متقين فإذا أن 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 أنسخ الأشهر أشهر الحرم فقتل المشركين حيث وجدتموهم وخذوهم وحصروهم وقعدوا لهم كل المرصد Okay, when the four months have passed, when the sacred months have passed, then find the mushrikeen and kill them wherever they are. This is in reference to what? Just like Lut or Hud or Nuh, they have shown the miracle that the camel has come out of the mountain. You have to believe and now you have not believed. Now the punishment of Allah is coming, except this time it is coming through the hands of the believers. What happened in the case of the Prophet is all of Quraysh started to believe, they accepted Islam. But Allah said, stand in every place and uh, trap them. وَالتَّابُوا And uh, return, repent to وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةُ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةُ فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ If they establish the prayer and give the zakat, then leave their way. إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah is غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَ فَأَجْرُهُ Then if any of the mushrikeen, they say, look, what is it? This is the topic we are discussing right now. If any of the mushrikeen, they ask for uh, protection from a Muslim. If any of the mushrikeen ask istijar, okay, فَأَجِرْهُ hatta yasma kalam Allah. Let them stay with you until they hear the word of Allah. So they know if they want to accept this. ثُمَّ أَبْلِغُ مَعْمَنَ And let them, help them reach their place of security, meaning their house. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ This is because they are people who still don't yet know. What is the truth? Okay, so uh, so now so this is specific to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This event of four months and to kill them after four months. This was specific to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, this should be understood very clearly. Uh, every non-believer, whether he is monk, is a monk, is so. Does the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, I have been commanded to fight mankind till they say La ilaha illallah. The traditions laid down about the sparing of all these categories include traditions by uh, Daud bin Hussein from Ikrama from Ibn Abbas. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, while sending out armies, do not kill hermits. Also, uh, the tradition related by Anas bin Malik from the Prophet ﷺ, do not slay the old, descript, nor the young, nor women, nor uh, uh, nor the uh, the um, and do not steal. Okay, uh, it is recorded by Abu Dawud. There is also among these the tradition related by Malik radiAllahu an from Abu Bakr radiAllahu an that said you have come across a people who will claim that you have do they have devoted themselves to Allah. So leave them and that to which they have devoted themselves. It includes the words, never kill women, children, old, weakened with, uh, uh, old, weakened with age. It appears that the chief source of disagreement in, the, in this issue sp uh, springs from the conflict between the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fight in the way of Allah against those who fight you, but begin not hostilities, though Allah loves not aggressors, versus then when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. So how do you reconcile this? So the Tawbah is specifically about the Prophet in which they was given four months. And over there, there's no chance, there's no like, if they want treaty, no. Over there it was, if they don't believe, you have to fight, okay, after the four months have passed. But the general instructions of Jihad are the ones in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is, if they, if they want peace with you, then do definitely offer them peace. This is part of how we show da'wah at a, at a higher level, okay? At the international level, you can say. Um, those who held that the latter verse was abrogated. So now, some one of the ways that the fuqaha dealt with this is because there's every time they saw 
a type of contradiction. Uh, they didn't have, uh, they didn't sometimes keep the Asuli principles in mind, or were not aware of them. So they looked at it as Nasikh and Mansuf, which came first, which came next. Okay. Uh, so when the sacred months have passed, slay them wherever you find them. Those who held that the latter verse has abrogated the meaning of the words, fight them in the way of Allah, those who fight you, meaning, uh, what, uh, so the Tawbah came after Surah al Okay. So then this came last to fight them now as fighting is prescribed primarily against those who fight, uh, said that the latter verse stands unrestricted upon its general generality. On the other hand, those who maintain that the former verse is governing the verse, and that includes all categories in, in, not involved in fighting, exempt it from the generality of the latter. Okay, So there is a issue of which is general, which is specific. Uh, in other words, restricted the latter to those who do or can provide hostility, thus excluding children, uh, old, and descript. Shafi'i argued that on the basis of the tradition of Sumara, that the Prophet ﷺ said, kill old among the polytheists and keep alive their young. It appears that the effective underlining cause for slaying, in his view, is kufr. It is necessary, then, that this cause be applied to all non-believers. Those who maintain that the peasants are not to be slain, argued, uh, on the basis of what is related from Zayd ibn Wahab who said we received a letter from Umar radiallahu anh saying do not misappropriate the spoils do not be perditious do not kill infants fear Allah in the case of peasants meaning don't kill the peasants a prohibition has been laid down in the tradition of Rabah ibn Rabah about the slaying of non-believing uh, serfs that he went out with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for a battle which he fought, and he, Rabah, and the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed by a slain woman. The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa taala stopped near her and then said, "She was not one of those engaged in fighting." He then turned his face to a group and said to one of them, "Hurry, go to Khalid bin Walid, that he must not slay infant serfs or women." Okay, the reason leading to their disagreement on the whole arises from their dispute about the effective underlining cause of slaying. Thus, those who maintain that the effective underlining cause for their disbelief did not exempt anyone of the, out of the polytheists. While those who maintain that he underlining cause is the ability to fight, there being a prohibition about the killing of women, though they be non-believers, exempted those who do not have the ability to wage war those who do not uh, those who have not affiliated themselves uh, with it like the peasants and the serfs so basically the war is to be waged with those who have the ability to wage war okay the uh, the prescription of mutilating bodies okay mutla uh, of the enemy is fully established meaning you can mutilate them because obviously if you're fighting them with swords someone's going to get mutilated the Muslim jurists agreed on the permissibility of slaying them with weapons, but disagreed about burning them with fire. Okay, so this now uh, is interesting because this calls into the question of modern weapons, right? Where even guns, they, you know, gunpowder or bombs, all of these nuclear weapons, they're all fire. A group of jurists disallowed burning them with fire, even attacking them with it. Uh, and this is the opinion of Omar and is narrated by, from Malik. Sufyan al-Thawri permitted this, while some of them said, if the enemy initiates this, it is permitted, otherwise not. So using these modern weapons, uh, by, by uh, many fuqaha would not be okay with it. The reason for their disagreement stems from the conflict of a general implication with a specific rule. The generality lies in the words of the exalted say, the idolaters, uh, wherever they are, uh, wherever you find them, uh, meaning wherever you find them, fight them. This is not to make an exception of any kind of slaying. Meaning, when Allah says, fight them wherever you find them, this is not any kind of, it means to fight them, but not in any, just any way. Uh, and certainly, uh, they mean here, in this case, not with fire. This does not make an exception of any kind of slaying. This specific implication was established when the Prophet wasallam said about a man, if you seize him, kill him, but do not burn him with fire, for no one punishes or has the right to punish with fire except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The majority of the jurists agreed about the permissibility of attacking fortresses by means of, uh, you know, these 
catapults, you can say. Which also then, you know, if you can't catapult something, then this also calls into question the, the, you know, so catapulting something in the, through the air and then you hit something hard with stones uh, also calls into question things like missiles. But missiles are also similar to, what? Arrows, which was allowed. So, uh, anyway, majority of the uh, jurists agreed about the permissibility of attacking fortresses by means of these catapults, irrespective of women or children being in them, because of the report that the Prophet ﷺ positioned uh, these uh, big, you know, catapult-type things against the people of Taif. There, there are, if there are Muslim captives and Muslim children in fortresses, in them, according to the group, um, if there are a, um, a, if there are Muslim children in them and Muslim captives in them, according to a group, these catapults should not be used, and that is the opinion of Awzai and Laith. Per, uh, Laith permitted this. The reliance of those who do not permit this is on the words of Allah, and if they, meaning uh, the believers and the disbelievers, had been clearly separated, we verily, we verily had punished those of them who disbelieved. Meaning, if if the disbelievers and Mus Muslims were not mixed, Allah would have punished the disbelievers, uh, uh, punished those of them who disbelieved with painful punishment. It appears that those who permitted this relied on jurors, uh, uh, on on the uh, the maslaha. They had a maslaha. They had a, the interest of the Muslims in mind. This then is the extent of harm that is allowed to be inflicted upon their life and liberty. The harm that is permissible in the case of their property, that is buildings, animals, crops, is a matter of controversy among them. Okay, This would also, by the way, include the issue of churches and monasteries and so on and so forth to some degree, even though that's specified in the Quran very, very clearly. Malik permitted the cutting of trees, picking of the fruits, destruction of inhabited buildings, but did not allow the slaughter of cattle and the burning of date palms. Awzai disallowed the cutting of fruit trees and the demolishing of buildings, churches and other. Imam Shafi'i said that the houses and trees may be set on fire if the enemy used them as fortresses, otherwise the destruction of houses and cutting of trees is disapproved. Now you'll see here that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times these difference of opinions occur because you're not taking directly from Quran or directly from Hadith, but you're extrapolating, okay, what is, and, and you're also probably looking at the practical situation on the ground, and then you're also looking at the Quran and you're coming to different conclusions, a different range of conclusions. The reason for their disagreement springs from the conflict between the practice of Abu Bakr and that of the Prophet wasallam. It is established that the Prophet wasallam set fire on that the Prophet wasallam set fire on date palms of Bani Nadir, and it is also established that Abu Bakr ordered his troops do not cut trees, do not destroy buildings. And this is what Abu Bakr said. Those who maintained that the act of Abu Bakr was based on his knowledge about the abrogation of the act of the Prophet Sallallahu as it cannot be conceived that Abu Bakr would act contrary to the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu when he was well aware of it, or that act, the act of the Prophet was restricted to the case of Bani Nadir due to their undue ag aggression against the Muslims, adapted, uh, adapted the opinion of Abu Bakr. Those who relied on the act of the Prophet Sallallahu and did not consider the act of the other as binding proof against it. Okay. Ad so, uh, ad adapted the view that tr uh, that trees are to be burnt. Malik distinguished between animals and trees and the killing of animals amounts to mutilation and the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited that. Therefore, uh, further, it is not per reported about the Prophet Sallallahu that he killed animals. This then is the identification of the harm that may be inflicted upon disbelievers with respect to life and property. So you can see there's a big debate here of whether you can inflict uh, harm on the buildings and, and their animals and, and mutilate them and so on and so forth. 
Section 4. The Condition for Declaration of War. The condition for declaration of war by agreement is the communication of the invitation of, to Islam, that it is, is not permitted to wage war on them unless the invitation has reached them. This is something upon which Muslim jurists agree because of the words of Allah, we will never perish until, we will never punish until we sent messengers. They disagreed on whether the repetition of the invitation was required on the reoccurrence of war. Okay, over here is something very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish anyone until he sends a messenger. Okay, but the Sahaba specifically had the status of Nahnu Ursilna. We have been sent on behalf of the Prophet. And the Ummah in general has the divine status, as Dr. Zaid sometimes talks about, the divine status of you have that, you are the representatives of the Prophet. So you have a certain right. Right, and because you have that divine authority, then there's a certain victory that comes with it, a certain help that will come with it, inshallah. The point here is that um, that this this, uh, this this point being raised here, that uh, you have to invite them to Islam because you are representatives of the Prophet. And once, what was what what's the rule with the Prophet wasallam? The rule with the Prophet was once he gave the da'wah, he gave them the invitation. Now fate has been sealed for them. Okay, they were going to either believe or they were going to be punished. And so, in a sense, by being representatives of the Prophet wasallam, the same thing is continuing, you can say. Of the invitation was required, uh, on if this giving the invitation has to be done each time you fight. Okay, some of them made this obligatory, some considered it desirable, some of them made it neither con considered obligatory or Desirable. This is because the foreign policy of Islam, the spreading of Islam, was the main goal. Okay, there's no doubt about this. And uh, you know, just like uh, the United States has used uh, its force, if it has force, it's going to use force to try to spread democracy and liberalism and humanism around the world. The reason for this, their disagreement, arises from the apparent conflict of the words of the Prophet ﷺ with his acts. Now, there's a disagreement amongst the fuqaha, which is uh, that should we look at the act of the Prophet or the words of the Prophet, right? And so, uh, it is, and so Imam Shafi'i is of the opinion that the words are more important than the act, because the act can be specific, the words could be more general. But anyway, this is a debate that happens in the Asul, Asuli uh, scholars, amongst the Asuli scholars. The reason for this, their disagreement arises from the apparent conflict of the words, of the Prophet ﷺ with his acts, it has been established that the Prophet ﷺ used to say to the commander upon sending a detachment, when you come to face your enemy, the polities, invite them to opt for three choices or inclinations, and whichever of these they agree to accept, withhold the attack, invite them to Islam, and if they re agree, refrain from attacking them, call them upon them, them uh, that call them then to move from their territory to the territory of the immigrants, okay, uh, to the territory of the immigrants, and inform them that if they do this, they shall have their rights guaranteed, uh, granted, uh, they shall have their rights granted to the Im immigrants. If they refuse to do this and choose their own abode, let them know that their status will be that of the Muslim Bedouin. Okay, so there are two types of, you can say, citizenships. One is those people living in the cities with the Muslims like in Medina or Muslims in Kufa and, you know, these garrison cities or the Muslims that will not be part of the Jama'ah as such. They will live as Bedouins. So they'll be given, those that are not living with the Jama'ah uh, will be given the status of the Bedouins. Okay, the law of Allah, which is applicable to the believers, would be applicable to them and they would have no share in the booty or in the spoils unless they fight along with the Muslims. So if they accept, if the battalion came, they accepted Islam, they have a choice, they go back to Medina and learn the deen, or they join the army and fight with them, or, you know, we'll be Muslims, we're not going to fight with you, but uh, we're also not going to, like, join you, okay? If they refuse to do this and choose their own abode, let them know that their status will be that of the Muslim Bedouins. The law of Allah, which is applicable to the believers, would be applicable to them, and they would have no share in the booty or in the spoils unless they fight along with the Muslims. If they then refuse, call upon them to pay jizya. Okay? If they refuse, if they accept, don't accept this, then now give them the choice of jizya. If they agree, accept it from them and refrain from fighting them. But if they refuse, seek the support from Allah and fight them. Okay? So, it is however established that the Prophet 
that he used to ensnare the enemy and ambush them during the wars. Some of the jurists, and these are the majority, maintain that the acts of the Prophet ﷺ abrogated his words. Meaning if the Prophet does something and he said something, he said something in some specific occasion to a specific person. So his doing something is more general and what he said is specific. And uh, so this is what uh, majority have kind of maintained. Imam Shafi has the opposite opinion. Okay. Uh, abrogated is, and that the implication of his words used to be valid in the early days of Islam before the Islamic movement had become widespread on the evidence that there is an invitation to migrate. Some of the jurists preferred the words over the acts, like Imam Shafi, as I mentioned, by construing the acts to apply to specific cases. But Imam Shafi argued that no, when he does something that's actually uh, specific. So you have on this one side, Quran says, "Ma yantiku anil hawa." He doesn't speak from himself, right? And then you have, "Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulullah uswatul Hasan sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah is the best of example, meaning this this is uh, the practical uh, example that he set, and that includes words also, by the way. Inna kala ala khulukin aadim. Your your example is to be is demonstrated of how great it is. So there is a different opinion on the words of the Prophet, the legal status that has, which is it general or specific compared to what he does. Okay, um, so uh, some jurists preferred the words over the acts by construing the acts to apply to specific cases. Those who preferred extending the invitation did so through the element of reconciliation between the uh, evidences. Okay. Identification of the number of womb retreat is not possible. With respect to the identification of the number of womb retreat is not possible. It is double the number of Mus uh, the number of, of Muslims that is by agreement because the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now Allah hath lightened your burden uh, for he know, knoweth that you are uh, there is weakness in you. So if there be with you steadfast a hundred they shall overcome two hundred. And if there be a thousand they will overcome two thousand by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if your enemy is twice you know when you when your enemy is double okay then you cannot retreat but over here double doesn't mean just in numbers it also means you have to like look at uh, your power meaning if they are uh, they are you're a hundred and they are two hundred okay but your hundred have no swords their two hundred have swords so you you, you can now retreat but if you are a hundred and they are two hundred, now you cannot, uh, uh, and you have the same weapons, okay, now you cannot retreat. So, held that, also narrated Malik, that doubling here is to be related to strength and not to number, and that is therefore permitted one Muslim where to retreat from a single enemy if he has a better trained mount than his better weapons and is superior to him, him in, in strength, okay. Permission for truce. Is truce permissible? A group of jurists permitted this initially without warfare, without necessity, if the Imam considered it to be in the interest of the Muslims. So again, this is Maslaha. The Imam, the, the, the Amir, the Khalifa has to consider, or, or is it better for us? Maybe they're a stronger opponent than us, and we know this, but they don't know this. So, you know, all things come to play, uh, play a role. Another group of jurists did not permit it, except on the basis of a compelling necessity, such as avoidance of disturbances or gaining, uh, gaining from some concessions for the Muslim community, which are not in the nature of jizya as condition for jizya, is that they be subject to the laws of the Muslims or even without taking anything from them. Awzai permitted that the Imam may negotiate a truce with disbelievers on the basis that something that the Muslim would give to the disbelievers if it is required as a necessity for avoiding a greater trial or on the basis of any other necessity. Shafrai said that Muslims are not to make any concession to the disbelievers unless they fear that they would be overwhelmed by the sheer number of the enemy in relationship to their own small numbers or because of a severe ordeal that is uh, subjected to them. Okay, so uh, this is clear in what it's being said, right? So uh, can you make truce or not? Well, it depends how strong you are, what you can gain, what the uh, the Khalifa thinks the Muslims can gain, so on and so forth. Those who upheld the permission of making a truce uh, when the Imam saw an interest uh, in, in, in this are Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, except uh, a Shafi stip stipulated that the duration of the truce 
not to be for a greater period than the one transacted by the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the disbelievers in the year of Hudaybiyah. The reason for their disagreement over the permissibility of truce without necessity uh, stems from the from the conflict of the apparent meaning of the words of Allah and when the f sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them and his words fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and his words and if they incline to peace, incline also thou also to it and trust Allah. Those who maintained that the in incline thou also to it and trust Allah and those who maintained the verse commanding fight unless they believe or pay jizya has abrogated the verse implying peace said that the truce is not permitted except in the case of necessity. Those who maintained that the verse implying peace was restricted and that and said that truce is permitted if the Imam considers it proper. They supported this interpretation with the act of the Prophet ﷺ in this case because his uh, ﷺ, uh, truce in the year of Hudaybiyah was not based upon necessity. The principle for Imam Shafi is to, is the command to fight until they believe or pay jizya. And this, in his view, was restricted by the act of the Prophet ﷺ in the year of Hudaybiyah. He therefore did not approve that the period be in access of what he negotiated by, uh, negotiated by the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They disagreed about this period. It, is sa it was said that it was for four years. It was said it was for three years. It was also said it was for ten years. And this was the view upheld by Imam Shafi'i. So we've been through this through, uh, because we went through the other book. Those who permit that the Muslim may conclude a truce with the polytheists on the terms of the Muslims would give it give them something if this was required by necessity or by of, of avoiding tribulation or the fulfillment of some other pressing need did so on the basis that the, of the report of that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was prepared to give part of the produce of medina to some of the disbelievers who were among the forces mustered to attack medina but the uh, but the madanis uh, did not agree so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh, willing to give, hey, don't attack us and we'll give you something in return. And so this shows that the Prophet's willing to make truce in addition to Hudaybiyah. Okay? But Allah granted him success without having a, made a concession to the disbelievers. Those who do not permit this unless the Muslims fear that they would be overwhelmed did so on the analogy drawn from, by, from their consensus on the permissibility of paying ransom for Muslim captives. The point being that Muslims in such a weak position are like prisoners. And so uh, the analogy is, so how, why can we make a truce? Well, because when we're too weak, it's like a prisoner. And a prisoner, you can ransom him. You can make a type of truce. So this is the, uh, the logical, the, the judicial, the fiqhi reasoning. Um, why wage war? Muslim jurists agreed that the purpose of fighting the book, the people of the book. Okay, So excluding... The Qurayshites, uh, the people of the book and the Christian Arabs is one of two things. Either it is for the conversion to Islam or the payment of jizya. The payment of jizya is because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fight against those who have been given the scripture uh, as uh, believe uh, not in Allah in the last day nor forbid that which Allah and his messenger have, have forbidden nor follow the religion of truth until they pay tribute readily being brought low. Okay. The majority of the jurists also argued about taking of jizya from the magis, the, the magians, because of the saying of the Prophet ﷺ established that with them the practice adapted for the people of the book. As you know, Ali radiallahu anh, when he moved to Kufa, he also had to deal with them and he took jizya from them. They disagreed about the polytheists and other people of the book, whether jizya is to be accepted uh from them or not. A group of jurists said jizya is to be charged from all polytheists, meaning all mushriks. This is the Imam Malik's opinion. The other group exempted from this the Arab polytheists. Uh, Imam Shafi and Thori and a group of jurists said jizya is only imposed upon people of the book and, and magians. Okay, so people of the book have to give jizya. The idol worshippers of Arabia specifically will be killed if they don't accept Islam. So this was uh, kind of like the prophetic because that was the Ithmam al hujjah that the Prophet did on Hijaz okay, of Arabia, Hijaz specifically. 
The reason for their disagreement stems from the conflict between the general and the specific implication. The general implication is the words of the exalted, fight them until no persecution until persecution is no more, and religion is for Allah. In the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there is no God but Allah, and if they say their lives if they say this their lives, their wealth are protected from me unless there's another claim on them and their reckoning is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The specific meaning is the in the directive of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the commanders of troops when he sent them to Arab polytheists who it is known were not people of the book when when you come to face your enemy okay face uh, the polytheists in so Bismillah continuing inshallah um, the reason for their disagreement stems from the conflict between the general and the specific the general implication is the words of the exalted fight them until there's no persecution and the religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, this is the, uh, amongst the principle, not only is this a fiqhi principle, this is an asuli principle, which is what is the ghaya, what is the maqsad, maqasid al sharia, right? The maqasid al sharia is until there's no more persecution for jihad. Um, in saying of the Prophet wasallam, I've been commanded to fight mankind as I explained this hadith that this was specific to the Prophet it doesn't mean that now the Sahaba will go and into the non-Muslim territories that are beyond Arabia and keep fighting no, this was in Arabia the establishment of the deen was on the Prophet wasallam, just as you know Allah sent Nu or uh, or the people of Lut wasallam, when they receive the message, when a message is received from a messenger, you have to accept. And the messenger comes with an authority, a divine authority, that, you know, either the judgment of God is given. So after uh, the message was delivered in Mecca, when the Prophet was in Medina, he had the divine authority now to fight on, on, on like with the, with the permission of Allah to fight, because the permission of Allah was given and to implement what Allah had given as the deen, and to bring judgment of Allah on the people, um, and punish the people with his hands, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about in Surah Muhammad. Uh, I've been commanded to fight mankind until they say there is no God but Allah. If, if they say this, their lives, their wealth are protected uh, from me, unless there is another claim upon them. Meaning, unless you've killed other human beings, or you've done something else by which uh, somebody would have uh, the uh, the right to claim on you, okay, and there is reckoning with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Meaning, on the day of judgment, then it will be decided on the matter. The specific meaning is in directive of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the commanders of troops when he sent them to the Arab polytheists. Now, remember, of all of the different groups of people that the Muslims fight, the Arab polytheists they were expected to become Muslim because the Prophet was right there and he was showing them the miracles. Okay, and so the judgment is most strong on them. It is known we're not uh, the book of the people. When you come to face your enemy, the polities invite them to opt for three choices. He mentioned Jizya as one of them. The tradition has already been mentioned. Okay, and then those who maintained that if a general command comes with the specific command, with this with the specific command, it abrogates it. Meaning, if there's a general command, and then there's a specific command, the general command uh, it, it gets a, so it, it, those who maintained that a general command, that if a general command comes after a specific command, it abrogates it. I Meaning, if there's something specific, and then something general, the general abrogates what is specific. So, let me give you an example of that. Let's say uh, I generally say, uh, go to the house. It's a general command. Go to the house. So now you, you can go to the house in any way. Go from the uh, front door, go through after knocking, go in different ways. But then I say, you can only go to the house if you knock. Now, first was general, then was specific. So the specific will have preference over the general. Okay, so this is the opinion. Remember, these are tools the scholars use to understand the texts. And sometimes when things seemed contradictory, to understand which came first, which came last, Right. Uh, this is what how fiqh was developed. Okay. So uh, those who maintain that if a general command comes after a specific command, uh, it abrogates it. Said that jizya is not to be accepted from polytheists other than the book of people of the book. The reason is, and this is the general opinion, by the way, is that 
Uh, but anyway, this is the reason that verses containing general commands for fighting them are later in time than, than this tradition, because the command to fight the polytheists in general is general and occurs in Surah Al-Baqarah. Sorry, Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay, so the the general uh, the general statements are in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, so it says the reason that the verses containing the general commands for fighting them are later in time, later this than this tradition, meaning this tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu because the command to fight the politics is general, it occurs in Surah Al-Baqarah, which was revealed in the year of the conquest of Mecca, while the tradition is dated before the conquest on the evidence of the invitation to them to uh, immigrate, to uh, migrate, okay? Though migrate to Dar al-Hijrah, meaning Medina. Those who maintain that the general meaning is to be construed in terms of the specific, whether it is earlier or later, or whether their being earlier or later with reference to each is not known, said that jizya is to be accepted from all polytheists. So this is also a group of schools that says, no, you can take jizya from all, all even the mushrikeen. With respect to the singling out of people of the book from all polytheists, this exemption from the general meaning occurred by agreement in the specific terms of the words of the exalted fight against those who have been given the scripture as believe not in his messenger and follow not the religion of the truth and until they pay uh, tribute okay they pay jizya and they're made low okay or they're brought low and the discussion of jizya and its ahkam will be coming up in the next chapter of this book these then are the elements of war one of the well-known issues related to this chapter is the prescription of traveling to land of the enemy with a copy of the Quran. The majority of the jurists maintain that it is not permitted because it was it was established it was established from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Hanifa said that it is permitted if it stays within the safety of the military camps. The reason for their disagreement is whether the prescription is general, having a general import or whether it is general with a specific implication so you know copy of the Quran uh, can you take it with yourself to the uh, land of the enemy this used to be a big fiqhi issue at one time by the way ahkam of enemy property uh, the comprehensive discussion of the fundamentals of this chapter is, to, is covered in seven sections the first is about the hukam of the fifth the hummus okay and the second is about the hukam of the four-fifths. Uh, so one is the one-fifth, and then what is the hukam of the four-fifths? Okay? And so when you have the spoils of war, there is the, the, the you know, the, the one-fifth goes to the state, basically, is the easy way to explain it. Now, because this is another very important point, because in the earlier days, institutions were not made. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, there would be a person who is a Hakim, and the Hakim was the hospital. There was a person, he was a teacher. He was the university. That's how it was, right? So there was an Amir or an Imam. He was the government. These institutions, the two things that, and this is important in general to keep in mind, that the two things that have been developed since the time of the Prophet ﷺ, because this is important to understand what changed. What changed from the time of the Prophet? Have we really changed so much from the time of the Prophet that Islam is no longer, you know, relevant? Okay, so there are two things that have changed. One thing that has changed is material power. Our understanding of the material world and how to use it to our benefit has changed drastically. And the second thing that has changed is social structures and institu institutions and institutionalizations of those social structures. So there used to be a Hakim, now you have a hospital instead of the Hakim. There used to be a teacher, now you have an entire university. Okay? And so you have the uh, the king or the Khalifa was the Amir, but now you have the institution of the office, the executive office, the judiciary office, which is the Qadi, right? And then you have the Shura, which is like the Congress or the Senate or the Parliament, like this. So this these are the two cha things that change. Uh, in order to understand the older books understanding these changes helps you understand in 
how does this relate to today? Okay, so, uh, so what to do with the one fifth? What to do with the four four fifths? Okay, the third is about the hukum of the anfal. Okay, what do you do with the spoils of war? The prize money. Okay, the reward. Fourth is about the wealth of the Muslims found in the possession of the polytheists. Fifth is about the hukum of the two kinds of land. Okay, the sixth is the hukum of faith. Okay, which is I'm fighting with someone and I got his, uh, you know, I killed him and and he's wearing uh, weapons or he's wearing maybe a gold chain or what can, how much when I take that what can I do what what is mine what is not mine. The seventh is about the hukum of jizya and the wealth acquired from them through a truce. Okay. Now, uh, the hukum of the fifth of spoils. The Muslim jur jurists dis agreed that a fifth, meaning one fifth because it comes in Quran, other than the lands acquired by force from the possession of the Byzantines belong to the Imam. Meaning, now, this is what I'm saying, so you have to make this clear. Imam meaning the Khilafa, the, the institution of Khilafa, the Khalifa. But obviously, the person has to manage it, but it will be the institution uh, in, in the modern times. The Muslim jurists agree uh, that a fifth, one-fifth of the spoils of war, other than the lands acquired by force from the, pos from the possession of the Byzantines, belong to the Imam. And the rest of the four-fifths. Now, why Byzantine have been uh, singled out? Uh, and this is a longer discussion that we'll have another time. Okay. The rest four fifths of it were for those who seized it. Okay, so one fifth goes to the government, which we will talk about in a second. Four fifths goes to those who seize it. Now, Omar al Khattab changed this, and uh, we will talk about that as uh, when we get into it. Because of the words of Allah, and note whatever you take of those spoils of war, lo, a fifth is for Allah and His Messenger, and for the kinsmen, and for the orphans, and for the needy, and for the wayfarer. So for Allah, his messenger, the messenger's family, right? The orphans, the needy, and the wayfarer, okay? So uh, so for Allah, his messenger, his kinsman, okay? The orphan, the needy, the wayfarer, okay? So if ye believe in Allah and that which has been revealed unto our slave on the day of discrimination, the day when the two armies, uh, two armies met, and Allah is able to do all things. They disagreed about the fifth. Uh, the fifth is divided further into five parts in accordance with the explicitly mentioned shares in the verse. Meaning, do you do it according to the shares? Okay, so there's a share for the messenger, his family, and then the or his his family, the orphans, the wayfarer, like this. Do you do it this way? The needy, right? So this is also a share. So they disagreed about the fifth. There are four well-known opinions in this regard. Number one, the first is the fifth is divided into five parts in accordance with the explicitly mentioned shared, uh, shares in the verse. This is Ashafi's opinion. The second is that they are divided into four parts and the words is for Allah are only an opening statement and do not imply a fifth ch share. The third opinion is that it is divided, uh, it is to be divided today into three shares. And that is the share of the Prophet and the kinsmen was eliminated with the death of the Prophet And the fourth is the fifth is the same category as Fay. Fay is when you again fight with someone, one to one battle or one to two battle, one to one battle, you kill him, you take his arm. So that's Fay. Okay. So the fourth opinion is that the fifth is the same category as Fay, okay? to which both rich and poor are entitled. This is Malik's opinion and of the jurists generally. Okay, Those who maintain that it is to be subdivided into four or five parts disagreed as to what is to be done with the share of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the kinsman after his death sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One group of jurists said that it is to be spread out proportionately among the remaining categories entitled to the fifth. Another group said that it is to be given to the rest of the army. A third group said that the share of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu belongs to the Imam. So the Messenger had the position of the Imam, the Khalifa. So now that the Prophet is left, that goes into the uh, share of the 
Khalifa. The share of the kinsmen is known for the kinsmen of the Imam. The fourth group said that it is used for arms and preparation. They disagreed as to who are the kinsmen. One group said that they're Banu Hashim alone, while another group said that they're Banu Abdul Mutlim and Banu Hashim. As you see, there's a lot of different opinions here. What the one fifth is for certain shares, but what to do? You know, we know who the orphans are. We know who the needy are. We know who the wayfarer are. We know that. But what do we do about the what do we do about the share of Allah and his messenger and his family, right? So the reason for disagreement over the question of whether the fifth is restricted to the stated categories or can it be extended to others besides them stems from whether the purpose of mentioning these categories in the verse is the allocation of the fifth or the indication of their priority over others, in which case it would belong to the category of the specific with a general implication. Those who maintained that those who maintained that it is a category with this with a, a category of the specific with a specific implication said that the fifth is not to be extended beyond these explicitly stated categories this was adopted the majority of the this is what the majority of the uh, jurists have adopted those who said that the categories of the specific with a general implication said it is permitted to the imam to spend it where he identifies the welfare of the muslims okay are these like the five categories or can you do with it what uh, the imam feels or the khalifa feels is to the maslaha of the Muslims. Meaning, is this a general command to do good with the one-fifth? Uh, those who maintain that the share of the Prophet ﷺ is for the Imam after him argued on the basis of what is related from the Prophet ﷺ. When Allah provides the Prophet with sustenance, it goes to the successor after him. Those who would grant it to the remaining categories or those who cease to do so on the basis of its similarity with the amount already earmarked for them. Those who said that the next of kin are the Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Mutlim argued on the basis of the tradition of, uh, uh, of the companion of the Prophet وسلم, Jubair ibn uh, Mut'im, who said the Messenger of Allah وسلم, divided the share of the kinsmen from the fifth among the Banu Hashim and Banu Mutlim. They said that Banu Hashim and Banu Mutlim are one category, while those who said that Banu Hashim are a separate category did so on the grounds of Sadaqah is not permitted to them. So either the, the portion of the Prophet goes to the Amir, the Khalifa, or it goes, and, and, the, and the portion that is for his family goes either only to Banu Hashim or Banu Hashim and Banu, Banu Mutlim. The jurist disagreed about the share of the Prophet in the fifth. One group merely said that it is a fifth and there is no dispute among them about the necessity, the integrity of his share, irrespective of his being present or absent at the time of the division. Another group said that it is uh, it is a fifth, meaning if he's present, and sefei and and this uh, safai, safai, uh, the prophet's choice. Uh, safai is a well-known share for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it was something that he used to select from the undivided spoils, something used to select from the undivided spoils, which could be a mar, a slave girl, a, a, a male slave. It is related that Safiya was from Safai. They agreed that no one after the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is entitled to Safai except uh, for uh, Abu Thawr, who held that it is to be treated the same way as the share of the Prophet Okay, that it is a fifth in the Safai. Okay, so some people said that this, uh, the, the share of the Prophet continues even in his absence, and uh, some said no. Okay, uh, the hukum of the four fifths of the spoil. So now, one fifth we've talked about, okay, which goes to Allah and His Messenger, meaning to the Islamic government. What do we do about the four fifths, the remaining? Okay, the majority of the jurists agreed that four fifths of the spoils are for those who seize them. Okay, meaning the Mujahideen. Now here's the problem okay, that Omar bin Khattab solved. If the Mujahideen are going around, around fighting Iraq and Iran and Egypt and all these lands, and four-fifths of all the wealth is given to the Mujahideen, they'll become extremely, what? Materialistic. And Omar didn't like this and he didn't want this. So one-fifth was one-fifth, but the four-fifths, he said, you will not get, that was for the Mujahideen, in the you know in the early years 
But then Umar radiallahu anh changed it as he saw that the empire is going to grow. Then you can't just give all of this to the Mujahideen. So it became part of the Islamic government. Okay. So the majority of the jurists agreed that the four-fifth of spoils are to be who seized them are for those if they acted with the permission of the Imam. If they disagreed about those who act without the permission of the Imam, about the person entitled to a share of the spoils, about the time, time of entitlement, how much, and also about the entitlement from the spoils before the division. The majority of the jurists maintained that four-fifths of the spoils are for those who seize it, whether they proceed with uh, the permission of the Imam or without the permission of the Imam. Because of the general implication of the words of the exalted, and know that whatever you take from the spoils of war, lo, a fifth thereof is for Allah, his messenger, and his family, and the orphans, and the needy, and the wayfair. And if you believe in Allah, and that which we revealed on our slave on the day of judgment. Then the two armies met, and Allah is able to... Uh, 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 day of discrimination, the, uh, the day when the two armies met and Allah is able to do all things. A group of jurists said that if a detachment or an individual act without the permission of the Imam, then whatever either brings back is a reward, nafal, that is to be appropriated by the Imam. Another group of jurists, jurists said that in fact all of it is to be taken by the person who seized it. Majority relied on the apparent meaning of the verse while the others relied on the nature of the acts that occurred during the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they, this is to this is so all troops used to proceed with the permission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it appears that they thought that the permission of the Imam was a requisite condition for it but this is weak who has a share in the spoils they agreed that the, they are those who are male free have attained puberty uh, among those who participated in fighting. They disagree about the case of the person who have opposite characteristics, that is women, slaves, and those who have not attained puberty. Uh, but we're nearing it. A group of jurists said that there is no share for women or slaves in the spoils, but some gifts are to be given to them. This was Malik's opinion. Another group of jurists said that no presents are to be given to them nor anything to be paid to them from the spoils. A third said that they have the same share as the shares in the spoil. This is Auzai's opinion. They also differed about the minor approach in, approaching the age of puberty. Some jurists said that a share is to be assigned to him. Uh, this was Al Shafi's opinion. Some of them stipulated that he should have the ability he should have the ability to fight. This is Malik's opinion. Some said that he is to be given a gift. Okay. The reason for their disagreement over slaves is whether the general communication of law includes free men and slaves together or only the free men to the exclusion of slaves. Meaning when Allah is giving these ahkam, hukam, is Allah talking to the free men or Allah is talking to the free men and the slaves? Uh, further, the practice of the companions is in conflict in in, with the general implication of the verse. This is because it was their general practice that may Allah be pleased with them that the slaves had no share. It is related, Umar bin Khattab and Ibn Abbas, uh, that it is related by Ibn uh, Abi Shayba from, through, uh, through various channels that uh, Abu Umar bin Abdul Bar said that the most authentic report is from Umar is that is related by Sufyan Uayna from uh, Amr bin Dinar, from uh, Ibn uh, Shihab, from Malik bin, uh, Malik bin Aus, uh, okay, uh, who said, Omar said, there is no one who does not have the right in this with the exception of those whom your right hands possess, meaning the captives of war. So it's not talking, so Omar, uh, everyone except for the captives of war have a right in the share of uh, those that... Uh, fight. Okay. The majority of the jurists decided that women are not entitled to a share, but to a gift on the basis of authentic narration of uh, um, uh, Umatiyah, who said, we used to fight along the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa tending to the wounds and nurse, nursing the sick, and he used to give us gifts from the spoils. The reason for disagreement arises from their dispute over whether women is similar to a man in being effective in battle, if she participates in it. They agreed that it is permitted to women to participate in war, therefore those who held them in similar 
to men granted them a share in the spoils, while those who held them to be less uh, effective in battle than men in, in this context either did not grant them anything or granted them was less than a share, and these were gifts. It is better to here to allow the tradition of Awzai believe that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam granted his share to women at Khaybar. And uh, let me see, what have I done? They disagreed about whether the traders and mercenaries are to be given a share. Malik said that they are not to be given a share unless they have fought. A group of jurors said that they are to be given a share if they were present during the battle. The reason for the disagreement here stems from the restriction of the general implication of the words of exalted and know that whatever ye take of spoils of war, Lo, a fifth of it is for Allah, for the Messenger, and by means of an analogy that dictates a distinction between these people and the rest of the fighters entitled to the spoils. Those who maintained that the hukam for the traitors and the mercenaries is different from the rest of the soldiers because they did not intend to fight but intended to either to, to trade or be hired for wages for fighting, that's mercenaries, included them from uh, excluded them from the general implication of the verse. Those who maintain that the general implication is stronger than analogy, let the general implication govern the issue. In evidence for those who have excluded them is what is recorded by Abdul Razak that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf asked one of the Muhajirun, who was a learned man, to go out to battle with him. He agreed to do so. When the time for departure came, he called him, but he declined on the pretext of needs of his children and wife. Abdul Rahman then gave him three dinars so as to make him accompany him. When they had routed the enemy, the man asked Abdul Rahman for his share of spoils. Abdul Rahman said to him, I will mention your affair to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he did mention him to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, these three dinars are his share in portion for the battle with respect to this world as well as for the hereafter. Abu Daud has recorded a similar tradition from from uh, Ya'la, okay? Those who permitted them a, sh them a share in the division held their case to be similar to the employment of hurling, which is in, in the which is the assist assistance provided by members of the one to others. That is, like a person standing aside to support the warrior. The jurists disagreed about such Hire, hirelings, okay? You hire somebody to help you in war. So this is what it is, with Malik permitting it and others disallowing it. Some of the jurists permitted this if granted by the Sultan alone or when there was a necessity. This was the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi. With respect to the condition which entitles a Muslim to share to a share of the spoils, most of the jurists said that it is his presence at the battle, even if he did not fight. If he arrives at the battle after the battle is over, he does not get a share of the spoils. This was upheld by the majority, while another group said that if he joins up with them before they move back into Dawla Salam, he is entitled to the share if he has employed um, somehow in its management. This is Imam Abu Hanifa's opinion. I also gave you the example of Uthman radiallahu anh, that a contingent was fighting and they had a backup coming. And the backup, because they came, they also asked for a spoils of war, and Uthman agreed with them. There are two reasons for this disagreement analogy and a tradition. The analogy is whether the role of the warrior is in preservation and protection of the spoils, similar to his role uh, in the acquisition. This is so as the active participant of the person in the battle is effective in its acquisition, that is, in acquisition of spoils, because of which he is entitled for a share. The role of the person who arrives late, but before the Muslim army moves to the land of Islam, is effective in preserving the spoils. Those who held his role in preservation to the role in acquisition said that he is entitled to a share even if he was not present at the battle. Those who said that such a role, such a role for purpose of preservation is weak analogy did not consider him to be entitled for it. Okay, so if somebody's there at the battlefield but he's not actually fighting but he's just doing side work, uh, like protecting the spoils, then he may not get a share. There are two relevant traditions in this, but they conflict each other. 
The first is related on the authority of Abu Hurairah who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu sent uh, Abban bin Sayyid with a detachment from Medina. With a detachment uh, from Medina towards Najd. Abban and his companions joined uh, joined up with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam at Khaybar after they the companions of the Prophet had conquered it. Abban said, O Messenger of Allah, give us a share of the spoils of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not grant them a share. Second tradition is that the report is the, is in the report that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that the day of Badr, Uthman had departed on business of Allah and the business of his Messenger. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam then allotted a share for him, but he did not do so for anyone else who was absent from the battle. They said that he was entitled to a share as he was busy on behalf of the Imam, the Khalifa. Abu Bakr ibn Mundir said, It is established that Umar bin Khattab radiallahu said, The spoils are for those who were present at the battle. Okay, the troops that put move out of the camps before for battle are entitled to the spoils. The majority of the jurists maintain that members of a camp participate with them in the spoils, even if they do not participate in the acquisition of the spoils in the in the battle. Okay, this is because of the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu detachments that went out to fight should share the spoils with those whom of them who are stationed. Meaning, uh, this is now talking about. Uh, those that are in the battlefield, but they have a certain position that's stationed within the army, even if they're not fighting, but they're fight, they're kind of like part of the military itself, they will get a share. So let's say that, you know, in the future, a nation states fall, uh, fall there's anarchy in the city, and uh, and there's a jama'ah of Muslims. So those people that will participate in the battle, they'll take a share of whatever they uh, win over. Okay, so... Uh, this is because of the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, the detachment that went out to fight should share the spoils with those of them who were in station. It is related by Abu Dawud further that these people are also effective in the acquisition of the spoils. Hassan Basri said that if a detachment departs from the camp with the permission of the Imam, they divide the spoils into five parts, and what remains is for the members of the detachment. But if they went out without permission of the Imam, they divide the spoils into five parts, and what remains is for the rest of the troops. Okay. Nikhai said that the Imam has a choice. If he likes, he may divide it into five parts of what the detachment brought in, or he may treat the whole as a reward. Okay. And uh, so when the Mahdi is here, he will have to apply some of these rules, or he may come up with some of his own rules, because it is ultimately up to the commander-in-chief. Nikhai said that the Imam has the choice. If he likes, he may divide it into five parts of what the detachment brought, or he may treat it as a whole. Okay. The reason for this this disagreement also stems from the similarity of the effectiveness of the camp in the acquisition of the spoils by by the detachment with the effectiveness of those who were present at the battle and who are members of the detachment. So, inshallah. So, over here, I want to mention Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, there are a few issues that should be clear. Number one, that there is the mission of the Prophet that is specific to Arabia. And when the Prophet وسلم, is given victory, because this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mujadila and other places, me and my messengers, we have to prevail. Another example of this, by the way, is that of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. See, he was a messenger and they tried to uh, kill him and Allah said no. And he has to come back to witness the annihilation of the people that he was sent to, the people that accepted, you know, his uh, risala, you can say, uh, that rejected him. That, that rejected his risala, the people that rejected his risala, he will see them when he comes back and witness their annihilation. So this is la aghlibanna ana wa rusuli. I and Allah says, I and my messenger, we have to be supreme. This is the law. Okay. So now, th so therefore, the it's not just the law. It is the judgment. It is the punishment. It is the annihilation. And in that, the verses of Surah Tawbah that are specific to the Prophet 
in which the Prophet gives them four, Allah gives them four months, either accept Islam or leave. And from here came the categorization of the types of uh, mushriks you fight. So the mushrik that's Arab from the time of the Prophet is like to be punished, right? Uh, that's like the divine punishment. Now, uh, the case with Ahlul Kitab becomes a little bit less, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, like the Mushrik, Arab Mushrik, non Arab Mushrik, Ahlul Kitab, like this. Now, that that's clear, the second thing that should be clear is what are, what is it, understand what we're, the context we're talking in. One is, I'm in a battle. And let's say, you know, there's a battle, and a battle will take like a whole day. And so you start fighting one person, then you fight another person, and you fight another person. And maybe in a battle, you end up fighting, you know, up to 10 people, right? And then as you have killed each person, you have marked. Uh, I killed this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. You go back and you can take out his swords, you can take out his guns, you can take out the jewelry he has, uh, even the, the, the donkey or the horse he may have had, right? And now you can, uh, take that for yourself. Okay. Now, uh, that, that is the people that you fought one on one. Okay. Combat. Uh, then there is, like, let's say we came into a village or a place, and we were fighting a people, and they were fighting us. Now we, uh, I fought, let's say, seven people, and Alhamdulillah, Allah allowed me to kill them. And they all have, you know, these like really nice swords, so I take all that. And uh, now when we conquered it, there's a stable of horses. Okay, now that there's a stable of horses, this is now going to be distributed amongst all of us. One fifth will go into the categories that we mentioned that uh, for Allah and his messenger and the messenger's family and uh, for the orphans and the needy and the wayfarer. Okay. And, uh, and then all the debate that goes around with that. So that's one fifth. Four fifths will now be divided amongst the people of the things that can be divided. The third level, which we haven't discussed yet in detail, okay is the division of land how land will be divided okay how much goes to the government how goes much goes to the people and what is the debate on this whole issue now having said that now let us inshallah continue also about uh, the uh, the rulings within the sharia it should be kept in mind what is general what is specific okay uh, what came before what came after Okay. Which rules came first? Which rules came next? Okay. A share in the spoils, then, in the view of the majority of the jurors, is given to the soldier in one of the two conditions. He should either be the one who has participated in the battle, or he should be the one who sheltered the fighting forces. They disagreed about the share of the horse rider in the context of how much is due to the fighter. The majority said that the rider has three shares, and the one and one share for him and two share for the horse now it makes a difference if you're coming into battle are you coming with a horse are you coming in with a camel are you coming in on the foot so on and so forth and the majority said that the rider has three shares one share for him and two shares for the horse abu hanifa said that two shares for are due to the rider and one share for the horse and one for him okay so uh, that only two shares are due to the rider, one for the horse, one for him. The reason for their disagreement arises from the conflict of the relevant traditions and the conflict of analogy with the tradition. Abu Dawud uh, recorded that Ibn Umar عنه, that the Prophet وسلم, allotted three shares for a man and his horse, two shares for the horse, one share for its rider. He also recorded a tradition of... Uh, uh, Mujammi uh, Ansari that has the same import as the opinion of Abu Hanifa. Okay, the analogy. Uh, oh, another thing that I should uh, make very clear here is that these people, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, but not so much Imam Shafi'i, but in the time of Imam Abu Hanifa and the time of Imam Malik and. How were they understanding the deen? 
you have to understand that the deen was fully implemented. And the way the deen was implemented in Medina, and the way that the deen was implemented in the garrison cities like Kufa, you know, our riwayat al Hafs, for example, the narration of Hafs and Kira comes from Kufa. So, just to give you the importance of the places, because Ali radiallahu anh moved the Khilafah, Dar al-Khilafah to Kufa. Now, these places, they already had Islam implemented. So, what Imam Malik is doing to some degree, he is looking at, okay, this is Medina, this is how they practice Islam here, and he's trying to preserve that. But in addition to just preserving that, okay, he's also trying to take the narr narrations and within the, the within the people of Medina and trying to adjust and fine tune because Medina is where the children of the Sahaba are. This is the ijma of the Sahaba in a sense. The children of the Sahaba this is a major place. So you need to he fine tuned the issues to what the and he was specifically looking at what the people of Medina were doing. Now. Abu Hanifa did the exact same thing in many ways, except he didn't make it a concept. He didn't call it I'm doing A'mal al-Kufa, even though he kind of did. But Abu Hanifa was also doing the same thing. He was taking from Ibrahim Nakhlai, he was taking from uh, his teachers, and then he was fine-tuning things from the other sources that he was getting to what the people were already doing in Kufa, because Islam was already established, right? So. These fuqaha, the early fuqaha, they didn't have to deal with how are we necessarily deriving the rulings. They had to just deal with, okay, this is the ruling. This is how the Sahaba did it, right? And they're seeing the product. They're seeing the fruit. fruit. This is how the Sahaba did it. These are the fatwas of Abu Bakr. These are the fatwas of Omar. These are the fatwas of Ali. These are the fatwas of Uthman radiallahu anhu. These are the fatwas of the different... Uh, uh, people in the, 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 in the Quda, the judges in the cities. These are their fatawas. And so they're there, they're studying this, and then what, they, this is actually coming first, and then they're looking at the Quran and the Sunnah, and then later on, the fuqaha, starting with Imam Shafi, is trying to see, okay, wait, the people of Medina are doing this, the people of Kufa are doing this, so let's go back to Quran, let's go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet and try to formulate a way of understanding why they're doing it this way okay so it wasn't more it wasn't like what we're used to today today what happens is someone says uh, what's the dalil I can do this so you go directly to Quran and then you go directly to the hadith and you then say okay you know this is how this is how it seems like we can do this right this is how we do it today but this is not how it was done in the past in the past it was done from the perspective of, okay, this is how the people are already doing it. Because these are the Saha these are the children of the Sahaba. These are already students of, you know, Ibn Abbas. These are already students of Ibn Mas'ud. These are already students of Ibn Umar. Okay? These are already students of the great Sahaba who had, uh, you know, the, uh, so they had the great knowledge and these are their students and this is, this is the fatwa. This is how, what Hassan Basri is saying, right? And uh, so on and so forth. You get my point. So they're coming. This, the fatawas came first. The formulation of how the fatawas are made came later. Okay, and the codification of Islamic law came first, about 150 years, you know, before before 150 years, you know. Umar bin Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu. Uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz comes into the scene in the beginning of the first century. He's the first mujaddid. So Abu Hanifa comes right after that. Abu Hanifa saw the era of Umar bin Abdul Aziz and the era after him. Okay, so Abu Hanifa comes in a hundred years after Hijra and Imam Malik also, and you know, so they're there between you know the years hundred to hundred and fifty. Get it? Okay. So, um, so they're early on. Imam Bukhari comes into the scene in you know, the year 200. So the Hadith literature is made much later. But all of that Hadith literature is there to refine and go back to what the Sahaba were doing and trying to understand what they were doing from the context of the saying of the Prophet So, anyway, let us continue, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> the analogy that con conflicts with the apparent meaning of the tradition of Umar is a share, is that the share of a horse uh, should not be greater than that of a human being. 
the end, uh, and that is why Abu Hanifa preferred the tradition that confirms with this analogy over the tradition that opposes it. Of course, a human being is more important than a horse. I mean, horse is not actually fighting, right? The human being is fighting on the horse. This analogy, however, does not hold as it is it, it, the human being who is the writer of the, this, it does not hold as it is the human being who is the writer of the horse and who is entitled to the share of the horse. And it is not unlikely that the effectiveness of the rider riding a horse be thrice as much as the foot soldier. Okay, so uh, this is why Abu Hanifa preferred the tradition that confirms the with this anal analogy over the tradition that opposes it. This analogy, however, holds that it is as it is the human being who is the rider of the horse and who is entitled to the share of the horse, and who is not unlike, and it is not unlikely the effectiveness of the rider riding a horse be thrice as that of the foot soldier, meaning uh, it, uh, it would be twice uh, uh, or, um, or equal, depending upon the faqih. This appears certain along with the fact that the tradition of Omar maintaining this view has greater authenticity. Muslim jurists, while considering how much a soldier is allowed to take from the spoils before division agreed about the prohibition of, per, uh, of it, like taking, uh, being a thief, uh, the spoils, okay? This is based upon uh, what is established from the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this, like the, his saying, turn in the thread and the garment for taking a th uh, stealing is a shame and a disgrace on the Day of Judgment for those who practice it. Meaning, instead of, you know, there there's 10 people fighting and uh, at the you, you took your fay, which is what you get hand-to-hand -hand combat but then there's let's say things that you saw and you're not going to keep it for yourself you have to put it like everybody has to put everything that they that was outside fate outside the personal battles anything that they they saw they'll bring it all put it together and then they'll divide it right and not to steal okay they disagreed about the permissibility of consuming food seized by fighters while they're still in the battlefield Majority of the jurists permitted this, while a group of jurists disallowed this, which is the opinion of Ibn Shihab. The reason for this, their disagreement emanates from the conflict of the traditions regarding the prohibition of stealing, with those implying permissibility of eating food, like the traditions of Ibn Umar, uh, Ibn Mughafal, and Ibn uh, Abi Awfa. Those who restricted the traditions uh, uh, those who restricted the traditions on the prohibition of stealing to those which permitted the eating of food by warriors held it to be permissible so if you're fighting uh you know the the food uh if you get it from let's say the 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 one of the areas where his food is and you found it you have to bring it in okay now this this will be like i said there are three parts there's the hand in hand combat what you can take from that and then there is what you get collectively and so does that include food or not uh and then there is what to do with the land you actually conquered okay those who restricted the traditions on the prohibition of uh, stealing are all, all which also permitted eating of food by warriors held it as permissible while those preferred the traditions prohibiting stealing uh, these did not permit it the tradition of mughafal is that he said, I came to a skin of fat on the day of Khaybar and whispered to myself, I will not give any of it to anyone. I turned around and there was the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala smiling at me. It is recorded by Bukhari and Muslim. In the tradition, uh, Abi, uh, Abi Awfa uh, said, during our battles we came upon honey and grapes that we used to eat and did not turn them in. This is by Bukhari. They disagreed about the penalty of the person who steals the spoils. A group of jurists said that his baggage is to be set on fire, while others said there is no penalty from except reprimanding him. The reason for their disagreement arises from their dispute over the authenticity of the tradition of, of Salah bin Muhammad, okay, uh, uh, from Ibn Umar, and he's uh, that he said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam burn the baggage of those steal okay over here I want to mention something very important 
That is that there are two ways to go about determining rulings, two big frameworks, okay? One is that uh, the more authentic a hadith is, so then that becomes a rule. The more authentic a hadith is, so this is more authentic, this one is less authentic, this one is lesser authentic than that. So then the, the we will go with the hadith that is more authentic and then the one less and then the one less, okay? So the, if there's a hadith that's authentic, that's the rule. So this is one way. And you have this, these both methods in amongst all of the fuqaha. So Hanafi, they have both of these methods. Shatrai has both of these methods. Maliki, Hanbal, like this, okay? So one method is you're looking at the tradition. And Ibn Rushd has this method, okay? And this method is a little bit more confusing, okay? The other method, okay, which is you're looking at the Asuli perspective. What is the asuli? What is the basic principle? Okay, the basic principle would be stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong. So therefore, what about stealing and spoils of war comes under that? Okay, same thing like for example, if I am mad and I'm cussing someone out. So, Quran says, say good things to people, that's the general rule. Then the Quran also says, La jahra bisu illa man bulim. Uh, there's no uh, saying something wrong and evil except for the one that is wrong. Okay, so you have these principles. Okay, so the principle is, for example, why are we fighting? What's the reason we're fighting? Okay, we're more interested in the principles, the wisdom, the purpose, the maqsid, the, uh, the 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 goal, and what are the principles? And the other method is we're looking at which traditions of the Prophet is more authentic and the one that's more authentic kind of like dictates the direction. So every mazhab, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, they have this kind of like two ways of determining rulings. And then these two are there. And then there's two more layers to that. And that is that the aql and naql. Okay, the logic of why this ruling is there, which has to do with the asuls. Why is this ruling there? It has to do with the principles. And then naql, which is what is written, is documented, meaning Quran in the Sunnah of the Prophet. So there's aql and naql, there is the asul, the principle, and then there is the nas, the, the, the tradition, the riwayat, and so on and so forth. Okay. The, uh, Okay, let us continue, inshallah. The hukam of anfal, meaning the reward. The now, you understand by shares, right? So they'll be like, let's say they got a hundred horses that in the in the spoils of war. They fought battle, and there were different horses in different par parts that they all got, and there were some horses and some sheep and some maybe, cr you know, different things uh, that they all put there, okay? And now... They have to divide it. So they'll make divide everything into shares and then divide the shares according to the number of people and how much each person has to get. The jurists agreed about the permissibility of imams granting a reward out of the spoils to whomever he likes. So you can give extra credit. The, the khalifa or the amir of jihad can give extra credit to whoever he likes. That is to add to his share. They disagreed, however, about the items to which a reward is to be given about its amount and whether it is permitted to promise it before the battle or or, or not further they disagreed of whether a muslim fighter is entitled to the possessions of the disbeliever whom he has slain this is what i was talking about the one-on-one -on -one battle okay or whether he is not entitled to it unless the imam grants it as a reward for him these are four issues they constitute the fundamental of this section okay a group of jurists maintained that the nafal reward is to be paid from the hummus, the fifth, which is due to the Muslim treasury. So the amir, the one-fifth that goes to Allah and his messenger and the messenger's family and the orphan and the needy and the wayfarer, that that goes to the government, the, he, the amir has control over that one-fifth. Okay, so he, if he's going to give extra, he doesn't take it out of the four-fifths chair that goes to everyone else. He gives it from the one-fifth that goes to the 
government, you could say, which is due to the Muslim treasury from there. This was the opinion of Imam Malik. Other group of jurists said that the reward is due with the fifth of the Khumas alone. Okay, is due from the fifth uh, of uh, of the Khumas alone, which is exclusively the share of the Imam. Okay, uh, so the share that belongs to the Imam, he can give from his own share, not even from the government's share. This view was taken by Ash-Shafi. A third group of jurists said that such favors are to be granted from the spoils as a whole. This is the opinion of Ahmed and Abu Ubaidah. Some of these jurists in, in, in the third group permitted even the giving of the entire spoils as reward. The reason for their disagreement stems from the question of whether there is a conflict between the two verses laid about the spoils on, or whether they indicate a choice. Uh, I mean between the words of Allah, exalted, uh, and know that whatever ye take of the spoils of war, lo, a fifth thereof is for Allah, and for the Messenger, and for his family, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the orphans, and the needy, and the wayfarer. If you believe in Allah, and that which is revealed unto our slave on the day, uh, on the day of resur uh, on the day, on the day of discrimination, the day when the two armies met, and Allah is able to do all things. His words, and they ask thee, okay, of the spoils of war, say, the spoils of war belong to Allah and the Messenger, so keep your duty to Allah and adjust your matter of your difference. Those who maintain that the former verse, and know that, uh, that whatever ye may take as spoils of war, has abrogated the latter verse, they ask thee of the spoils of war, said that the reward is due from the fifth, or the fifth of the fifth. Okay, those who maintain that there is no conflict between the two verses and that they indicate a choice, that is, the Imam may grant a reward from the undivided spoils if he likes, and he has the choice of not granting any reward of giving all four fifths of spoils to persons acquiring them, said that he may grant the reward from undivided spoils. So, this is, you know, again, uh, verses of the Quran. This is another point that I should make is that. There, if there are two verses and they contradict, then the weight, the easiest way to solve them is to see which one is general, which one is specific. The other way to solve them is to see which one came first, which one came second. Okay, but uh, you bring, try to bring them together, and generally there should not be con a conflict per se. There may be a conflict in hukum, but when you look at the bigger scheme, especially within the Quran, especially from a tafsir perspective, usually you will find them in harmonious to one another. Um, there are also two traditions on this uh, issue. The first is related by Malik from Ibn Umar that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, sent a detachment of troops towards Najd and Abdullah bin Umar one was among, among them. They secured a large number of camels as spoils. Their two, sh uh, the, their two shares of spoils came to 12 camels each and they were given a camel as a reward. This indicated the reward was given after the division of the fifth. Okay, the second is the tradition of uh, Hibab ibn Maslama, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to grant an initial reward of a fourth to the troops upon their departure after excluding the fifth, and thereafter he used to grant them a third as a reward upon their return after excluding the fifth. That is initially at the beginning of his battle at the time of the departure. Okay, so the Prophet وسلم, did it that way according to some of the narrations. Now you'll see and you'll realize that when it comes to jihad, the principles of jihad, who you're going to fight, how you're going to fight, what you can do, can you bring down the trees, can you bring down the buildings, how you're going to divide the spoils of war, there is a difference of opinion in all of these issues. Okay. And so what does that mean? That means that there is flexibility for the Ummah. That means that there is flexibility for the Ummah that uh, when the practical need becomes uh, in a certain way, then the Ummah has this, these traditions to have a wide scope to choose from. And if they follow a certain fiqh, they still have a wide pool to choose from if their practical situ situation doesn't allow them to follow a certain fiqh. 
The second issue is about the amount that the imam may give away as reward. A group of those who permitted the giving of rewards for undivided spoils said it is not permitted to grant more than a third or a fourth. And this is the prescription based upon the hadith of Hib, uh, Ibab ibn uh, Maslama. Another group of jurists said that the imam may grant a detachment all that is acquired as spoils. And this is on the basis that the verse about anfal is not abrogated and is it governs the issue and that it is to be it is to construe in its unrestricted general meaning those who maintain that it is restricted by the tradition said that it is not permitted to him to give us reward more than a fourth or a third so uh if there is a verse of the quran and there's a hadith of the prophet that uh clashes it now, the general principle is uh, to let go of the hadith, especially if it's not authentic, right? If it's very, very authentic, then you do have to consider how you're going to bring the two together. Issue number three, it is, is the imam permitted to make a promise of reward before the battle? The jurist disagreed about this. Imam Malik dis, uh, disallowed this while a, a, a group, Rahmatullah disagreed about this while a group of jurists permitted it. The reason for their disagreement stems from the conflict between the meaning of the purpose of war and the apparent meaning of the tradition. The purpose of the war is to seek the favor of Allah, the majestic. The word of Allah should reign supreme. To make the word of Allah supreme. Okay. Thus, if the imam offers a reward before the battle, there is an apprehension that the warriors will spill their blood for a cause other than seeking the favor of Allah, the tradition which implies through its apparent meaning and the permissibility of declaring a reward before the battle is the tradition of Hibab ibn Maslama that the Prophet ﷺ used to announce a reward in the battles for troops moving out of the camps if at a fourth of the spoils they would capture and a third from which they captured on their return. It is obvious that the purpose in this was the active pursuit of the enemy. Okay, So there can be the battle and then chasing the enemy in the spoils of war once you're chasing the enemy. Issue number four. The fourth is the issue is whether the slayer is entitled to appropriate his own accord, accord the spoils of the, of the person slain or whether he may do so only if the Imam has determined it as a reward. They disagreed about this. Imam Malik said that the believing killer is not enti entitled to appropriate the spoils of the person killed unless the Imam considers it by way of ijtihad to be a reward for him. And this too after the battle. This is also the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, Thawri, Ashafi, Ahmed, and uh, Abu Thawr, Ishaq, and a group of the predecessors said that the killer is entitled to it irrespective of the imams okay uh, so this is also the opinion of imam wa hanifa thawri shafi ahmed thawr ishaq and a group of the predecessors said the killer is entitled to it irrespective of the imam saying so so they said you are allowed to take the faith or the the hand to hand combat uh, booty uh, so some of these latter jurists deemed uh, appropriation to be right under all circumstances and they did not stipulate any conditions for this. Some of them said that he has this right only if he slays the person face to face in combat and not treacherously or when the disbeliever is in retreat. This was a Shafi's opinion. Some of them said that the killer is entitled to appropriate the property of, if he slays the enemy before the battle and not in the thick of it or if he does so after the battle. What would happen is sometimes they would have one-to-one -one before the battle begins. So maybe there's some of the opinion was that you can't do it once the ba the big battle starts between two groups, but when there was one-on-one, -on -one, then at that time they could take that and that. Okay. If he kills him in the thick of the battle, he does not have the right to appropriate his property. This was Auzai's opinion. Another group of jurists said that if, if the declared reward property of the enemy slain is excessive, it is permitted to the imam to give a fifth of it. The reason for their disagreement stems from the probability of meaning in the saying of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Hunayn in, in, when there was a setback uh, in the battle. Whoever slays a person shall have his spoils. It is 
probable that he meant this as a reward, but can be also interpreted as the right, uh, as a right for the slayer. So when the Prophet said وسلم, on the battle of Hunain, if you kill someone, you have his, you have his, you can the the hand, the one on one combat, you can take all their stuff. Was this a right or was this a reward being given from like an emir or in this case the Prophet وسلم. So they disagreed about this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one of the group of jurists said that that if declared reward property, uh, uh, the, so let me just read from here. If he kills him in the thick of the battle, he does not have the right to appropriate his property. This was the Auzai's uh, opinion. One of the jurists said that if he declared the reward, the property of the enemy slain in six is excessive. It is permitted for the imam to give a fifth of it. The reason for their disagreement stems from the probability of the meaning of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Hunayn when there was a setback and the Prophet said ﷺ, whoever slays a person shall have his spoils. It is probable that he ﷺ said this as a reward. It can be also interpreted that he said this is in the sense of the right of the person, not just a reward. Imam Malik the stronger probability was that it was way of reward on the grounds that it was not proved for him that the Prophet ﷺ ever said this or decided it except on the day of Hunayn and also because of its conflict with the verse of spoils it is permitted to um, because Imam Malik is saying that the ayah of the Quran of Anfal does not talk about this hand-to-hand -hand combat and taking but just that you just take everything all the spoils everything everyone all the spoils and put it in one place and then divide it you know, this one-to-one -one combat is not mentioned in Qur'an. And uh, so that was Imam Malik's uh, opinion. Okay. So, um, now let me see. Um, this was a Shafi's opinion. Some of them said that the killer is entitled to the appropriate, uh, the property slaves from the en enemy before the battle and not the thick of it. Um, wait, what did I do here? Hold on. Um, For Imam Malik, the stronger probability was that it was by way of reward on the grounds that it was not proved, uh, and the Prophet didn't do this on any other day except for Hunayn, and it was also, uh, and also of its conflict with the ayah, okay, um, uh, which is, uh, um, and know that whatever ye take of spoils of war, lo, in the fifth of it for Allah, his messenger, and the reason is that when it is explicitly laid down in the verse, a fifth is for Allah, it becomes obvious that the four fifths are a right of those acquiring the spoils, just as uh, when he laid down explicitly a third for the mother in inheritance, it became obvious that the remaining two thirds were the right of the father. Uh, Abu Omar said that this uh, that this saying was recorded from him وسلم, on the day of Hunayn as well as the day of Badr. It is related from Umar bin Khattab an, that he said we did not divide the spoils of the slain into five parts during the period of the Prophet وسلم. It is recorded by Abu Da'ud uh, from Auf uh, bin Malik and Khalid ibn Walid that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave a decision for appropriating the spoils of the slain. Uh, Ibn Abi Shayba has recorded from Anas Ibn Malik that uh, Al-Bara bin Malik made a change toward uh, Al-Murzuban on the day of Dara uh, and struck his uh, saddle with a lance killing him. His, his spoils in monetary vo uh, value came to 30,000. When he, he, with this report, when this report reached Umar bin Khattab, he said to Abu Talha, we did not divide the spoils of the slain. Of slain. Uh, we did not divide the spoils of the slain into five parts, but spoils of Bara have reached an exorbitant figure, and I have no choice but to add it to the spoils that which have been divided into five portions. Uh, and then uh, Ibn Salim said that Anas bin Malik related that this was his first salah from a slain person uh, that were divided into five parts in Islam. This was relied upon 
those who made a distinction between small and excessive possessions of the slain. So if you kill somebody and you get a lot, then the emir say, they say, hey, you can't have just all this, you have to put it in with the rest of the people. They disagreed about the spoils of the slain that are due to the slayer. <coughs> a group of jurists said that a slayer is entitled to all that he finds on the person of the slain. Another group of jurists said, excluded gold and silver from this, okay, uh, as they have been added to general spoils. So you see, um, uh, gold and silver, so if you're going by principle, like the Asuli perspective, the principle is money is part of the spoils. So if, if you even find it on somebody you killed, well, gold and silver will have to go there. You can take swords and things like that that I've mentioned, arrows and so on and so forth. Section 4, the hukam of the property uh, of Muslims found in the possession of disbelievers. The hukam of the property of Muslims found in the possession of disbelievers. They disagreed about the case of property of Muslims that is recovered from the possession of the disbelievers. There are four well-known opinions on this subject. The first is that, that the wealth of the Muslims that is recovered by the Muslims from the possession of the disbelievers is for the owners that uh, of that wealth. And the, warriors, and the warriors who recovered are not entitled to any of it. Those who held this opinion included Imam Shafi's disciples and Abu Thawr, uh, Rahmatullah Alayh. Okay. Uh, the second opinion is that what is discovered by uh, what is discovered by Muslims is treated as spoils for the army, and the owners are not entitled to any of it. This opinion was held by Zuhri and Amr bin Dinar, and is also re reported by Ali bin Talib. Okay. The second opinion is that which is recovered by Muslims is treated as spoils for the army, and owners are not entitled to it. So this was including the opinion of Ali ibn Talib. Uh, the third opinion is that the owner of the property is entitled without any payment uh, to what is discovered of the property of Muslims before the division. But what is discovered after the division is to be divided to the owner after he pays its value. Those who hold this opinion are, are divided into two groups. Some of them maintain that the rule applies to all Muslim property that is uh, to, recovered by Muslims from the possession of the disbelievers. Whatever the manner in which it can in, in which it came into possession of the disbelievers and whatever location. Those who held this opinion include Imam Malik, Thawri, a, a group of jurists, uh, and it is also related from Omar ibn Khattab. Some of them made a distinction between what came into the possession of the disbelievers by the use of force and what they carried off uh, until they transported it to the land of the mushriks. Um, and between what was taken back from them before they were able to seize and carry off into the polytheist ter their territory. So there's a different opinion. Let's say somebody stole your stuff and you caught him before he got back to home. Now you take it back, what happens now? Because a lot of times they would have a battle and then they would run after the, uh, let's say they lost and now they're running back and now they're running after them, right? But as they're running, as they ran, as they lost and they were running, they took some of your stuff. So now when you get there, now what are the rulings for that? Okay, so this is what's being discussed uh, over there. Uh, until uh, between what was taken back from them before they were able to seize and carry off into the polytheist their territory. They said th that this the first kind of property is if it is identified by the owner before its division belonged to him. But if it comes across after the division, he has a right to it after paying its price. They maintain, so uh, if you get your property before the spoils of war is counted, then you can take it. Otherwise, he has to pay something of its price before he can take it. Okay. But if he comes across it after the division, he has the right uh, to it after paying its price. They maintained, on the other hand, that the property that was not gathered by the enemy so as to be transported to their land belongs to the owner before the division and after the division. And uh, this is the fourth opinion. The disagreement arises from their dispute about whether the disbelievers can legally own property of the Muslims taken by force. And the reason for their disagreement on this issue arises from the conflict of the relevant traditions and also the current, uh, the conflict of analogy. This, this is so that the tradition of Imran bin Hussein, 
indicates that the disbelievers cannot own anything extorted from Muslims. The tradition says the polytheists raided the freely grazing animals around Medina and snatched uh, Ubda, a camel belonging to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with a Muslim woman. One night, uh, when they had gone to sleep, a woman arose, but any camel she touched would bray until she came to Abra. It behaved in a docile manner, so she mounted it and headed for Medina, making a vow that if she had, was saved by Allah, she would certainly sacrifice the animal. When she arrived in Medina, the camel was recognized, and she was brought to the Messenger of Allah, sallam, and she informed him of her vow. He said, what an ungracious reward. A vow is not oper operable in what the child of Adam does not own, nor is there a vow for an evil deed. Likewise, the apparent meaning of the tradition related by Ibn Umar conveys the same meaning. Its content is that his horse ran away and was snatched by the enemy, but the Muslims came upon it and returned it to him during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah, uh, wasallam. Both traditions are authentic. The tradition, on the other hand, that indicates the opposite, namely, disbelievers can own Muslim property, stems from the saying of the Prophet wasallam, Has Aqil left a house for us? Meaning a question. He wasallam, had sold his house that he owned in Mecca after migrating from there to Medina. The analogy is that those who considered wealth to be similar to uh, the person of the individual, uh, the, ind the ownership, right, of an individual for ownership, said that just as the disbelievers cannot own persons, as is in the case of a rebel in comparison to a law-abiding person, that is, he cannot own any of the two things that are detriment of the right of the law-abiding person, those who said that the disbelievers can own our wealth argued that the person who does not own the wealth is liable for it if its substance is destroyed. They agreed that the disbelievers do not comp uh, do not compensate the property uh, for the Muslims. From this, it follows that the disbelievers can own captured Muslim property, for they had been owners, they would have been liable for compensation. Uh, meaning, you're you're only liable for compensation if you own it. Right. If, if you don't own it, how are you going to be uh, liable for compensation? Those who made a distinction between the hukum before the division of the spoils and after, and between what polytheists acquire from the Muslims by, by force and what they get without violence, like a runaway slave going over to them of his own accord and a horse going back to them, have no legal basis. The reason is that there is no middle ground between saying that the disbelievers can own Muslim property and saying that they cannot, unless this is proved through a transmitted evidence. So those that are against it. The proponents of this opinion, however, made this distinction on the basis of the tradition of Hassan ibn Amra from Abd, uh, Abdul Malik from Taus and Ibn Abbas that a man found his camel that had been taken away by the polytheists. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said to him, If you came upon it before the division, it belongs to you. But if you came upon it after the division, you have to pay its value. Hassan ibn um Umara is by agreement a weak narrator, and reliance is not relied upon his narr narration for argument by the traditionalists. What Malik had, uh, had recourse to in this, as far as I know, is the decision of Umar on the issue, but he did not rule that he should pay its price if he took it back after the division, judging on the basis of the apparent meaning of, the tra of, of his tradition. The exemption made by Abu Hanifa in the case of the uh, Umul Walad and the uh, Mudabar, okay? Uh, is, so, so Umul Walad is, uh, you, ha you, you know, you have your, uh, you, win your, you win the war, and the Amir of Jihad says, you can take this lady home, okay? And you take this lady home and you show your wife that the Amir of Jihad has told me to take care of this lady. So she's kind of like in marriage with you, okay? So 
the, the, there's also difference of opinion is the marriage done the minute he gives it to her or you know what what the status is but anyway this is mamalikat ayman from what your right hand possesses now if it is the case of umul walad now umul walad is the lady that you had that you were taking care of from the right hand you possess but now you have her child okay uh and then there's uh uh there's the 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 slave the the right hand she becomes free at the death of her master okay and so out of all kinds of wealth is meaningless the exemption made by Abu Hanifa in this case is of an umul walad and the uh mudabbar uh out of all kind of wealth is meaningless this is this is also as he ruled the disbelievers come to own all kinds of wealth in the face of the rights of the Muslim, except in these two types. Uh, likewise, Malik's opinion, acquiring the Imam, requiring the Imam to pay the ransom for the Umul Walad if her owner finds her after the division. If her master does not do so, uh, her master is to be compelled to pay the ransom. And if he does not have the money, she is to be handed over to him. And the person from whom the share uh, she has been taken out of is to pursue him, the owner, for her value, which is considered a loan until his condition improves. This too is the opinion for which there is no basis in analogy. If the disbelievers did not own her, he has the right to take her back without paying the price, but if they did come to own her, he has no claim upon her. Further, there is no difference between her and the remaining types of property unless it transmitted evidence where uh, where to establish this okay so these are like but what you'll notice here that something very important is most of these discussions about jihad and what to do are about the, the land of the polytheists okay so therefore this is about that area that the prophet sallallahu is going to bring his judgment and this has to be kept in mind so the rules change when it came to the Byzantines, but in the and and so there were similar rules across you know this whole land that was pagan all the way to even Iran okay and then you have the Byzantines in the north and then the rules of jihad change in there those are going to be more discussed when we discuss territory and lands and so on and so forth so uh, all of this needs to be kept in mind in its proper category the, the rules that go for Arabia uh, spill over to other places okay if there is a war but the um you could say the the but there will be some things that are specific to the prophet and jazirat al arab okay okay uh, under this principle uh, i mean the, their dispute over whether polytheists can come to own property of muslims is a disagreement of the jurists about the disbeliever who converts to islam and has in his possession the wealth of the muslims whether his ownership is valid imam malik abu hanifa is said that it is validly owned by him while shafi abiding to his principles said it is not okay this is a good example of principles right so you're a non-muslim you have stolen property of the muslims or you have property of the muslims you become a muslim now if you go with principle what is the principle the principle is that stealing is stealing and therefore you have to give it back if you become muslim you have to give it back to muslim brother but uh imam malik say uh, imam Hanifa says that uh, it is valid that he can keep his stuff okay and the principle for there is 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 different uh, uh, but I'm not going to go into the details of that right now just let's read this whether the ownership is valid Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa said that it is validly owned by him while the Shafi abiding by his principle said it is not Imam Malik Abu Hanifa disagree when a Muslim goes over to the other side of the when a Muslim goes over to the side of the disbelievers by way of stealth and brings over property from their possession that belongs to Muslims, Abu Hanifa said that he has a right to this property if the original owner wants it back. Abu Hanifa said that he has the right to the property if the owner wants it back. He has to purchase it by paying the price. Imam Ali said that it belongs to the original owner and he did not maintain his principle he, he did not maintain his principle 
Relevant to this topic is also the disagreement about a warring enemy who converts to Islam and migrates, leaving after, behind in the Darul Harb his children, his wife, his wealth, whether they would be for what he left behind the same sanctity that is applied to the wealth of the Muslims, his wife and children, so that the Muslims cannot acquire them as spoils if they came to have dominion over them. So let's say somebody becomes Muslim and now he's fighting, the, uh, the Muslims are fighting the land that he became Muslim from. Will they have possession of his wife and children if they defeat that land? Okay. Um, so that the Muslims cannot acquire them as spoils if they have come to dominion over them. Some of them said that all that he left behind has prote protection of Islam. While others said there is no sanctity whatsoever. Now remember we were reading earlier where a person has the right to give aman. Like Umahani gave aman. Okay, you, I protect you, I will give you protection as a Muslim. Okay, so keep that in mind too. Some of them said that all that is left behind has the protection of Islam, while others said there's no sanctity whatsoever. Some of them made a distinction between his wealth, on the other hand, and his w wife and children, on the other hand, saying that his wealth has no protection, his children and wife stand protected. This runs contrary to the analogy and is the opinion of Imam Malik. The principle is that permissibility, absence of sanctity of wealth arises because of disbelief and the cause of sanctity is Islam the Prophet Sallallahu said and when they pronounce it the Shahada their blood and wealth stand protected from me this is an evidence against those who thought that there are factors other than Islam that make wealth permissible meaning just because the Prophet said if you say the Shahada then your blood and wealth is protected does not mean if you didn't say the shahada and your blood and wealth is not protected of course it's still protected but it has more sanctity you can say in the eyes of allah this is the, there this is an evidence against those who thought that there are factors other than islam that make wealth permissible like ownership by enemy or other factors those making this claim need uh, to adduce some evidence and the fact is that there is no evidence on the basis of which there can oppose this principle, and Allah knows best. Okay, the hukum of the land conquered by Muslims by use of force. Okay, so this is a very important chapter.